Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks Sunday, September 23rd, 2018. This is episode 1526. Enjoy. Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by JW Player, the most powerful and flexible video platform, letting businesses, including Twit, customize the video experience on their website. To learn more and get 50% off your business subscription, visit jwplayer.com slash twit and use the code twit at checkout. And by Carbonite, from customer data to disaster recovery and backup, automatically protect everything in the cloud with Carbonite. To learn more, visit carbonite.com. Hello there, and welcome to The Tech Guy. This is the show where we talk about your technology and help you understand your gadgets and what's happening in the tech world. Plus, we're going to answer your calls about technology. I am here to help. My name is Rich Demiro, filling in for Leo Laporte today. I'm the tech reporter for KTLA Channel 5 in Los Angeles. A warm good morning to you. My personal mission is to help you get the most out of technology. And if you want to learn more about me and uh, myself, just go to richontech.tv. We have a great show for you today. We're going to talk about lots of stuff that happened in the tech world. We're going to take your calls at 8888-ASK-LEO, 1-888-827-5536. The FBI this week put out a bulletin explaining the latest trick by cyber criminals. And, you know, we go about our lives every day and just kind of do our thing. But while we do our thing, there are people out there that are trying to get your stuff. They're trying to figure out the holes, the breaks, the cracks in the system. And these guys are pretty smart. And I say guys, guys, gals, they could be anywhere, anyone. But the latest trick they're trying to do is actually steal your paycheck. And this is happening here in the U.S., this is not the old days where they used to take a, you know, the mail out of your mailbox. This is sophisticated because many of us get our checks direct deposited. So that's what they're targeting, your direct deposit. Imagine not getting your paycheck one week because it has been redirected to someone else's account. Most of the time that this happens, the person who is the biggest culprit is actually you. You're the weakest link because you're handing over your information that allows these crooks to get your paycheck. They call it social engineering. So the crooks get people to hand over access to their payroll accounts. So if you work for a big employer or almost any employer, you've got you know your direct deposit, right? You log in there, you put in your direct deposit account, you get your paycheck deposited, and everyone goes on their merry little way. Well, these guys are targeting you and your login to your account at work, not just your regular work account, but the account that sort of handles your direct deposit. So if you work for a company that, you know, you kind of tell them, you pop in your numbers, your routing number, your checking number. You say, hey, I want this percentage to go into this account. I want this percentage to go into this account. And that's what they're targeting right now. And they're doing this in many industries, but specifically education, healthcare, and airline employees. But again, that's just the biggest concentration. You think about it, there's a lot of people in all three of those industries, right? So if they can target them with these emails that are well-crafted and well-written to target those folks, that's a lot of folks. And what are they doing? Well, they send you an email that says something to the effect of, hey, um, you know, we noticed there's a problem and we need you to log in before your next paycheck and just check everything over. Just kind of, you know, make sure all your information is, is correct. And you see this email, you go, oh no, I need to figure this out. I need to get this resolved before my next paycheck. I don't want to delay in my check, my direct deposit to my account. So you click the link in the email, you log in and hmm, what happens? nothing on your end. You, you might just be brought to some random website or a thank you page or something kind of weird. And that's when you realize something's up. And the second you realize that something's up is the second that they go into work and they go into action. So the number one thing they do is they log into your account using the password and login information that you literally just handed them. 
And then they, number one, turn off all your email alerts. So now they are in control of your account. They turned off all the account alerts, so you're not going to get any notifications when you change anything. All those email confirmations and things that says, hey, you changed your checking account number or your direct deposit checking account number. And then they direct your paycheck to their prepaid card, and then they cash it out. It's kind of tough to trace a prepaid card because they'll just immediately take the funds out of that card when they go there. Now, you may be thinking, well, doesn't it take a week for me to get my paycheck? Doesn't it take a long time for this all to happen? Well, how many times a year do you check this account to see what you've done, right? I mean, I've only logged in a few times to change accounts. And I'll tell you one time when I changed account numbers, I put the wrong account number in for a portion of my personal paycheck and a couple hundred bucks went to someone else's account. And I didn't even know this until I, a couple of weeks later when I said, hey, I wonder if that direct deposit ever went through. I had like a little savings account I was saving up for. And sure enough, I looked at my statement weeks later and realized from my employer that, no, that money had been deposited in someone's account that was a very similar number to mine. And I emailed my employer and guess what they said? They, oh, we'll look into it. There, nothing ever happened. I never saw that money again. So that was for something that was my mistake. Imagine if it's not your mistake, how much more time this is going to take. So what can you do? Number one, we've heard this before. Don't click links in emails, even if they seem to be from a legit place. A lot of times you can tell the email's kind of written weird, but these guys are getting really smart. They're sending us emails for all kinds of stuff. You might get an email from Apple that says, hey, uh, confirmation of your purchase of $50 worth of gold coins in that game you're playing. And you go, what? I didn't do that. And you click the link there because it has a convenient link to, you know, dispute this charge. And next thing you know, you log in without even thinking and boom, again, they've gotten your account. So don't, don't click these links in emails. If you ever get an email like this, always, always, always navigate to the website of what you're trying to do. So if it's Apple or anything else, you got to do that. Um, the other thing that you need to do is tell someone. If you get one of these things from your HR department, tell them, right? You need to make sure they know so that other people at your business don't have a problem like this. Uh, over in Atlanta, Atlanta schools were hit. They had to reissue $56,000 in paychecks because of this scam. So this stuff, it, it's just kind of common sense, but not really because you're busy working. I get it. And you're not busy sitting there trying to protect yourself from all these people that are coming at you that you don't even realize. So how can you protect yourself? And I know you guys are listening and you're sitting there saying, I don't have time for this. I can't sit there and set up a password manager or, you know, whatever. But it comes down to three different types of people in my mind. There's the type of people that reuse the same password across all their accounts. That's bad. The people that use the forget password link every time they want to log in, that's bad. Or maybe they have your, your passwords written down on a sticky note near your desk. Actually, that's not as bad. It's bad for people walking up to your desk, but actually that's quite safer than some of these other methods. But to me, to avoid these headaches, two things you can do. Turn on two-factor authentication. It's a big term. All it means is that when you log into one of your accounts, you're going to get a text message to your phone. You take the code that they text you in that message and you pop it into the website. Without that code, if a bad person was to get your account login, they cannot proceed. Because if it happened, let's say someone got your password, you all of a sudden get this random text to your phone that says, here's your login account for Twitter. And you go, hmm, I didn't try to log into Twitter. And now you're onto something and you realize, hmm, I should go change my password. The other thing, password manager. LastPass is a good one. Dashlane is a good one. 1Password is a good one. iPhone even has one built right in. I don't care which one you use. Just use one. Yes, it takes a little bit longer. Yes, it takes some time to set up, but use one. It will, it will save you one day. And please do not use the same password over and over and over. So be aware of this stuff. You're listening to The Tech Guy, Rich DeMuro, in today for Leo Laporte. I am ready to take your calls about tech at 8888-ASK-LEO, 888-827-5536. Let's talk about your technology after this. Welcome back to The Tech Guy, Rich DeMuro, sitting in today for Leo Laporte. Phone lines are open at 8888-ASK-LEO, 1-888-827-5536. Give me a call. We'll talk about technology. If you have a problem with your gadgets, 
You still got that blinking light on your VCR? Well, I hope not, but that's an easy fix. <laughs> maybe I'll maybe I'll tell you how to cut the cord if you still have that. Wow. Um, maybe you got a new iPhone. Maybe you got a new Samsung phone. Maybe you need an app recommendation. You want to find an app that does something. Been getting a lot of questions to my uh, website, richontech.tv, about Spectrum Mobile. So uh, let's see here. I would like your opinion on Spectrum Mobile from Cindy Lou. She says, been a Spectrum TV, internet, and phone customer for years and was curious about their new mobile service and if it's a good thing. So if you're in a place that has Spectrum Internet, they've been advertising pretty heavily this new Spectrum Mobile TV, uh, mobile service. It's like basically your phone service. And the price is pretty good. 45 bucks a month for unlimited. And if you want to pay by the gig, you can pay just $14 a month or $14 a gig rather. So what is the catch? $45 a month for unlimited is about half what the big guys are charging. And this actually runs on one of the big guys' networks, presumably Verizon. Plus, you get all the Wi-Fi hotspots from Spectrum. So why would you not switch immediately? Well, I looked into this, and it is a good plan. I mean, you really, the fine print is there, but it's not as bad as you think. So you do get unlimited. Obviously, all these unlimited plans, they do throttle you at a certain point where if you've used way too much data, they might slow you down. But the reality about this one is that uh, it's not too bad. You get 20 gigs. After that, your experience speeds might be reduced. Um, you can use hot, five gigs of hotspot data. So after you use that, they will bring you down to a slower speed, basically an unusable speed. So if you use more than five gigs of mobile hotspot on your computer a month, you probably don't want to do that. Um, you get DVD quality video, so that's 480p. So if you like watching your video in HD, you're not going to get that through this Spectrum Mobile. Now, a lot of the companies do only stream now in that DVD quality. T-Mobile says they do this. Even Verizon does it on certain plans. I actually pay extra just to have the HD video. Um, and you have to have your internet subscription. This is the biggest thing that you need to know about the Spectrum Mobile. If you want to save that money, think about it. They're a cable company. They want to bundle. So you have to have your internet service to keep this subscription. And if you don't, they're going to charge you an extra $20 a month and your Wi-Fi speeds are going to be limited. And you won't be able to add additional lines. So if you don't keep your Spectrum internet at home, basically this is not a good deal. Now, for some of you, that may not matter. Some of you may think that you're not going to leave Spectrum Internet and you want to do this. And you can save basically $45 a month, which is a pretty good deal. And that includes unlimited talk, text, and data. The other thing you need to know is that you do have to buy one of their devices. So you have to get your phone from Spectrum Mobile. You cannot bring your own device, at least not at this point. Now, personally, I don't see any reason why you shouldn't be able to bring your own phone, but most people or many people don't have unlocked devices, so clearly they want you to have a good experience and use something that works with this, and so you do have to buy your phone through them. The phones they offer are some of the popular ones, iPhone XS Max, $45 a month for 24 months iPhone XS is $42 a month for 24 months. Samsung Galaxy Note 9, $42 for 24 months, on, on, on. So I'm getting a lot of questions about this. It's not a bad product. I just think you have to understand if you're keeping that Spectrum internet service and you don't mind buying a new phone from them, you're in the market for a new phone, then you know what? That's not a bad deal. Labs. Kim Schaffer. Um, the show Kim. Will be posted oh, here's later Kim. On we we got Kim. To that whole first well, segment. Kim is uh, she's still answering calls. Phone lines are open at eighty eight eighty eight. Ask Leo. One eight 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 two seven five five three six. We'll see if Kim. Uh, Kim. Kim is still. Uh, she's taking calls. Let's see here. Let's go to. Um, let's just take a call uh, with Danny in San Diego. Danny, you're on with Rich. What's going on? Hey, Rich. Uh, I have a quick question for you guys. It might be a little technical question, but um, 
I have a service with AT and T. I've had it with them for the last ten years. Um, just within the last maybe uh, three months, I've been having issues with them with the errors popping up on my um, web pages, a DNS error or timeout. I um, got I upgraded it to a new router, the newest router. Uh, my solution was to go ahead and uh, manually change their DNS settings to uh, Google or to Open DNS. Okay. Now I had escalated the call to management, and he reassured me, yes, this new router would uh, would allow me to manually change the DNS settings. So I got the router, I configured it, and the router the uh, settings are grayed out. Mm. Um, I called to level two tech support, and they said they can't do anything about it, that they can't uh, change the settings. Um, so I was wondering if this was part of that, uh, that net neutrality thing that they won't let you change the DNS settings. No, it's not. Um, and generally I usually change mine to Google or open DNS as well, which is like 8888 and, uh, what is it? 1111 now? Uh, uh yeah. Now what kind of computer are you running? Uh, well, I, I'm, I have multiple. I have Windows and uh, Mac. On Mac, um, you can do it pretty easily on your computer. You know, you can just go into your network settings and uh, select the connection that you're using and just go into DNS and actually just delete the DNS server that's in there or add the one that you'd like, and it will automatically take effect on that connection on your computer, right? Okay. No, no. Won't that affect it? Because if it, that's going that's downstream and now it's going up to, through the router and the router said that AT&T's DNS is, so that kind of negates the... Uh, In my experience, it does not. In my experience, if I set it on my computer, it will go through that because you can tell when you do a search. So if you do a search on your computer and it kind of times out or anything times out, you can tell which page you're getting based on that DNS setting. So um, on your router, if you got a router through... Usually what happens is these companies send through their settings because they want you to have the best possible experience with their internet. And also they want to make sure that things resolve to what they should do. So um, you should be able to change it. It's not part of net neutrality. Uh, that is not that is not related to it. Um, and I think that uh, you just have to do some more tweaking on there on your router. Generally, your, your ISP is going to try to change it back to what they want. But I think if you change it on your computers, you should be good to go on those on that window computer on that windows computer and also your mac computer those are those are pretty simple fixes and if you want yeah there is there is definitely a way you should get it to stay on your router unless it's one of their routers now if it's one of their routers you probably won't have that ability to do that but uh, i've had at&t in the past as my home internet and i was able to do it as well um, you just have to make sure you are uh, logged in you know, as an administrator on that router to make those changes but uh, good question danny and uh yeah, there are some advantages to uh, changing your DNS settings, but most people probably don't do that. Phone lines are open at 8888-ASK-LEO, 8888-ASK-LEO, 1-888-827-5536. You're listening to The Tech Guy, Rich Demiro sitting in for Leo Laporte today. We'll take more of your questions and we'll talk to Johnny Jett coming up next. You're out. Where do you think all the iPhones are made? Hey, Kim. Sorry. <laughs> did you... Did you? Uh, I caught you off guard there, so... Yeah, I was actually getting a call. <laughs> and I was trying to take it. So oh, I my gosh. I didn't even hear you. Okay, so I'll bring you up in the uh, third... After Johnny Jet. Oh, whatever. Yeah, that's fine. But anybody that wants to call, this is a really good time. <laughs> Just letting you know. Uh, let's see. Do we have Johnny Jet? He's going to be... Uh, what was that? What was that sound? Oh. Uh, uh, we're calling him up right now. Okay. I was not ordering lunch. Huh. No. That would be funny, actually. They See, we should do that. <laughs> like, I go every time I go to you, you're like, you're just like, I'll take a plain bagel with um, <laughs> Caesar salad. Caesar oh, salad. I hear Johnny Jet. There's Johnny. He's in the background. <laughs> you heard me laugh. Yeah, I did. How you doing? Good. How is Barbados? Barbados. Oh, uh, it's it's warm, <laughs> <laughs> it's, but it's beautiful. We got up early this morning, caught the sunrise, took my boy out to the beach. You know, it was beautiful. The water is so warm. The, uh, the sand is like is like white powder. What are you? Uh, what are you doing there? I'm attending a conference tomorrow. Mm. 
the SETW, Society of American Travel Writers. Actually, my wife is speaking at it. Oh, so she does travel too. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah. I want to make sure my mic's not on. <laughs> she's your, on. Mic, your mic is on. I'll okay. turn it off. <laughs> Thank your you. mic is live. <laughs> but okay. She's big on Pinterest. She's big on Pinterest? Yes. Is so she like her, a Pinterest her, influencer? Yeah, there, she's a Pinfluencer. What? Get <laughs> out of here. Johnny so actually, she was Jet. Supposed, there are so she many was layers to, here. With a woman with, uh, Pinterest. It was supposed to be just her and a woman from Pinterest, but the woman from Pinterest had a um, back out last minute, and um, so she's doing it with someone else from from Flightographer, actually, which Flight. is a great company. I don't know if you if you know them. I can even talk about them on the radio. No. On the radio. What do you want to talk about today? I've uh, I, we can talk about anything, but. Um, you know, one of the things I thought we could talk about is, you know, booking tickets for Thanksgiving. Okay. If you want to do that or. Yeah, anything. let's talk oh, about look. that because I, I actually wrote a blog post about that this week. So. Um, okay. So we can talk about that. All I right, love, good. I love that. How's my connection? Seems fine. Barbados has good internet. <laughs> yeah, not too shabby. Um, now, Leo so. spends the whole, he spends the whole segment with you, right? He does, okay. and if you, if you need to fill in, I'm happy to uh, do another segment if you need. Uh, uh, I heard a little bit of your um, conversation, so if you need fillers, I'm happy to go another one. No worries. I think if we're if we're this light on the phones right now, I, I wonder what's going to happen when the football game starts. <laughs> well, the Giant game's on now. I'm a Giant fan, which oh, you might be too since you're from Jersey. I'm actually, this, this season, I am uh, just starting my – Love affair with the Jets. So I used okay. to watch them back in the day. I'm not really into uh, pro football. So, but this I, this season I decided it's to. You it's know. a good season to start with uh, Donaldson. Yeah, I know. Well, that guy, uh, the the kid is uh, Darnold or whatever, it's right? Good. He's from USC. Yeah. Sam Darnold, which not is Donaldson, where I went. So yeah. Right, he's a great kid. He's really good. Um, let's see. Yeah, they they lost to the Browns uh, a couple days ago, and um, that was a big loss because big good for the Browns because that was like the first time they won in a long time in in over a year. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> like a ridiculous amount of time. Yeah, but um, yeah, the football game, the Raiders game is on here, which is shocking. They're playing Miami. Actually, it's not that shocking because they're playing Miami. Nice. And we're three hours and seventeen minutes away from Miami. By what playing. time is it over there right now? Same as the East Coast. When I actually originally emailed you, I thought it was an hour ahead for some stupid reason. And then, um, so, but I would not have never made it yesterday. We, uh, the plane latch door got stuck, so they couldn't get the luggage out on time. And um, so I would never have made the call yesterday. Oh my gosh. All right. Let's, uh, we're coming up here. Welcome back to the tech guy, Rich DeMuro, in for Leo Laporte today. Talking technology. And what a great song to bring on my guest, Johnny Jett, who is always flying somewhere. He is currently in Barbados and joins us now. Johnny, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. So how is Barbados today? Oh, it's 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 warm, beautiful. The sunrise was amazing. I, I don't know what the water temperature is. I should, I should look it up, but it, it feels like it's about 84 degrees. And um, I woke up early and just took a walk on the beach with my my two-year-old and he jumped in the water and my wife's like don't get him wet and i come back and he's filled with <laughs> of sand course what is so he a little wet. gremlin yeah whatever you do <laughs> don't get him wet that is my wife she, she you know for some reason you know like we get it kids want to just if they see water they want to splash around right no matter what they don't care if they're in their bathing suit or not um they're going to come back soaked <laughs> that's right we were in Florida for a few days before this to break the trip up because we live in L- L.A. And, of course, he jumped in a puddle in Florida, and then we had to go get new shoes. His, they, they just – and anyway. They jump in puddles it. because of Peppa Pig, by the way. There's an episode where they jump in muddy puddles, and that's why all the kids I, love to jump in puddles. It's also built Peppa. in, maybe. All right, so let's talk <laughs> holiday travel because it is uh, the end of September – People have been watching and thinking about going on these trips for the holidays. You've got Thanksgiving coming up. You've got the holidays before the new year. So uh, let's talk about that. Is, is there still time to book? There's definitely still time. Actually, I would tell people not to book yet. Uh, according to some research by Expedia and Hipmunk, 
they're saying to wait. Actually, Hipmunk says the best week to buy for Thanksgiving is October 1st. Mm. So you have another week or two, um, and they'll save 23%. You don't, the reason why is because you don't want to book too early with flights. And I and I love monitoring flights. I um, use Google Flights mostly, but there's also Yapta, Y-A-P-T-A. And um, uh, there's another one too, Fair, Fair Compare. And you can just put in whatever flights you're looking for or even routes or even uh, Yapta. You can put what price you want to pay. And if it dips below it, you can get um, – you they'll, they'll alert you. But with, with Google Flights, I've been monitoring a flight um, from um, – <clears throat> actually to here, to Barbados, from Miami to Barbados. And I booked uh, like a month ago and it because it was expensive. It was like six fifty, and I didn't I, – I just thought it was going to keep going up. And then, of course, four days ago, I get an alert saying it just dropped down to like – Two two hundred, or actually below two hundred, and I was like, "Oh my gosh!" So sometimes they get you, sometimes they don't. But it's, generally, it's always better to book early. But uh, they're telling you, they're t- the experts are saying, "Don't book yet." I'll add another. Um, I love Google Flights, and I I'm like you. I always have something tracked on Google Flights, and it is really crazy because we're in this world of big data. And that applies to these airline prices now. It used to be, you would look, I mean, I would love to see a study of how long people took to book flights back, you know, 10 years ago versus today, because it could take me six months, right? But (laughs) probably back in the day, you said, okay, I'm going home and you would just book the flight. Like you would just call the travel agent and book it, right? They tell you the price and you say, okay, let me book it. Um, I'm looking at Hopper data and they say the average flight price will change 102 times between now and Thanksgiving, 152 times between now and Christmas. And like you said, Johnny Jet, if you get those flight alerts from Google Flights, you can see it'll be like, okay, your flight just went down 100 bucks today. Your flight just went up 50 bucks. It is all over the map with these things. And what I like about the Google Flights is that they'll tell you, you know, tomorrow there's an you know, a good chance that your flight's going to go up 18% Yes, or whatever the price is. And you're like, okay, I better go buy. And then sure enough, I do check it and they do go up. So I do listen to that data. But then again, a day later, it could go down again. Right, right. They don't know if it's going to go down necessarily, but they are pretty good when they say it's going to go up. Correct. But again, you know, I should tell people if you are booking on the Wednesday before or the Sunday after, you should get that as soon as possible because those are the days everyone wants to fly. You're not going to really get a good deal. So and especially if there's like a Southwest sale, jump on it right away. Don't wait to that October 1st or or that week. Um, just, you know, if you're flying those days, you, you, you need to book early because – there's there's no reason for an airline to give you a deal. I you know everyone says that the um, flights are going up in terms of passengers, so there's really no reason why. But if you can just you know move your days by a day or two, and I actually wrote a post on it, and I uh, screen grabbed everything, um, you can see just by sa- just by going a day early, you can save almost fifty percent. I think it's forty percent, mm, but that's yeah. big money, especially if you're traveling with a family. Yeah. And uh, yeah, those, I learned that when I, you know, now that I buy four tickets when I travel places, it's, it get, it adds up very quick. I have from Hopper, they say you can save the most money by leaving on Thursday, November 22nd and returning on Wednesday, November 28th. So clearly you have to fly on Thanksgiving to get the best flight, to get the best price. And I've done that before, by the way, I've flown on Christmas day. I've flown on Thanksgiving day. Um, when you want to save the most, if you don't want to do that, the next cheapest day to fly out for your Thanksgiving destination is Monday, November 19th. So you do need to be able to be flexible, right? If you want to save the most. For sure. And if you want certain seats, but the problem with the th- flying on Thanksgiving is that all the morning flights will be gone by now. Mm. So they're telling you the data that, you know, Oh, that's true. PM or 8 PM. And those are times that you don't really want to go. So that's one problem I have with that data. Um, so I would leave the Tuesday or Monday before Chase, take those times times off, trying to get the kids out, and then come back on the Friday after even, because that's usually a really good day to fly. And I've done it before, and I've actually used my miles to fly on that day, because no one really wants to fly on that Friday mm. um, in, well, in that's, North America. Yeah, that's, I mean, as some people you do are. if they have to. So if we're looking at Christmas, uh, according to Hopper, they're saying Tuesday, December 18th, returning Thursday, January 4th. That's a long time, though, right? It is a long time, but... Again, that's that's the way you save money. So if you're if you're going to use your vacation days wisely, but you can still find pockets. So you just got to keep searching, set those fair alerts, and try different different tips. You know, try alternate airports. Uh, you could even try a hidden city trick, which the airlines do not. 
like what's the, talking about and um, what's the hidden city trick it's a little bit complicated but it, you know what the hidden, hidden city trick is correct no what is that did i lose you i hear i hear okay. you uh, okay sorry yeah, the hidden it's... city trick <laughs> go ahead it, it's yeah so you know i'm at a conference they must have just logged on everybody um so the hidden city trick is let's say you're flying la to charlotte well only american airlines flies that route it's gonna be 560 one way but if you put in la to jacksonville or to richmond or even LaGuardia, the flight routes through charlotte so what you can really do is just buy a one-way ticket don't check a bag make sure you get on the plane early and then get off oh but if you do it a lot the airlines will take away your mind I, I was gonna say will you be banned from that airline if you do that all the time yeah if you did it once in a great while you know Things happen. People get sick. I, it's happened to me. Um, and, the, and there's another good route, L.A. Miami. It, first class is normally 1600, but if you buy L.A. Miami San Juan, it's 360 one way. Wow. Why flat seats? What? I can go 360 first class to Miami with the hidden one city way. trick. Wow, one that's way. amazing. Yeah, and that's the other thing. You got to book that one way because believe me, when you don't take that second flight, you're not able to get on those return flights. So you have to do that a one way flight. For sure, and you got and you can't check it back, but you really should just go to San Juan, and they need your help anyway. Wow. Johnny Jett, uh, coming to us live today from Barbados. Uh, tell people your website and how they can get in touch with you. It's johnnyjett.com, J-O-H-N-N-Y-J-E-T, one T. I'm sadly not related to Joan Jett. Um, but, um, and I see you in that in-flight magazine, too. What's that uh, magazine oh, you're in? Alaska. I'm yeah, a, I, I was just, just reading that the other day. Very cool. Johnny Jett, thanks so much for joining us today from Barbados. Uh, we are talking about technology. The phone number is 8888-ASK-LEO, 1-888-827-5536. My name is Rich DeMuro. I'm in for Leo Laporte today. We'll take more of your calls coming up after this. Hey, Johnny. Sorry, we uh, we it, it did go in and out a little bit. So, um, oh, God, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Just it's just we kind of lost you for a couple times. So. Oh, shoot. Um, but that's okay. We heard, we heard everything. The Hidden City thing is really interesting. Um, I've heard about that, but I never knew what it was. So that's that's the. You really got to warn people, though. They, they one way, one no way. bags, no bags. Get on the plane first, and the airlines do not like it. And you kind of overshoot where you're supposed to go. That's so. How would you figure out? Is there like a? I assume there's a list of places that you can figure that out. Well, no, there's a website called What's, Skip Lagged. S K I P L A G G E D dot com. Okay, Skip Lagged. And this, and he was sued by United and Orbitz, and um, he won. They they tried to get him. They tried to get, shut it down. Yeah, it's, this was the kid that started this, right? Yes. Okay, I yeah, think they pitched me on doing this. Oh wow! But I I thought it was too sketchy for uh for my audience. I didn't know if they would, you know, like people. I I could just imagine the calls saying, "I booked this flight and now I'm banned forever." So no, you won't be banned, but again, you just don't want to do it regularly. So and wait, you're saying, let's say I go from LAX to where did you say Barbados? Charlotte, oh, Charlotte, so, Charlotte. So do I type that in here, and then it gives me yep. the? Yeah, but but there, but on the on the left there's some. I have to look at the site. Oh, there I see, Hidden options. City. Okay, yes, Hidden City only. Oh, that's so crazy. There it is. And it will and it will tell you probably either Laguardia, Richmond, or or Jacksonville, or what? somewhere around. So it goes from. LA to Charlotte and then Charlotte to Atlanta. Okay, so you're skipping the Atlanta part, but it's so much cheaper. Wait, exactly. let me, okay, let me see how much cheaper it is if I just do it. Okay, so it's 201 if I do the hidden city. I bet it's 500. It'll be around 500. Normally is. Wow. Oh my gosh, this is interesting. I can't tell on this one because it's giving me some other things, but yeah, you're probably, yeah, oh, this is a 26 hour stop. Um, yeah, you don't want that. Normally, yeah, 585. You're right. That is crazy. Oh. That's amazing. And it's the yeah. same exact thing. What? Okay, folks. That's crazy. I, I found my new way to book. <laughs> so I'm gonna be I'm gonna be wanted by the airlines. <laughs> What's that? No? All right. Why not? We just I'll just bring her on for the next one. Yeah. It'll be fun. If you want to. Yeah. Um all right, Johnny, I'll let you get back to Barbados. Take care. Okay, bye. Thank you. Oh, you got the... <laughs> okay, bye. Is that, is that your wife getting ready for the uh, the thing here? Yes. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck, you guys.
Welcome back to the show. You're listening to The Tech Guy. I'm Rich DeMiro sitting in for Leo Laporte. Just checking out the website that Johnny Jet told us about that can really save you some money. Skip lagged. Flight to Charlotte, the normal way, 585. Their little method, 201. Get to the same place. Amazing. Good tip from Johnny Jet. Kim Schaefer is our call screener. Kim? I think I might do some more traveling with that little tip. Right? <laughs> Isn't that great? I've been traveling a lot. I've never done that. I'd be a little scared to do it because you yeah. kind of have to ditch your second flight. But I could definitely, I might try it once just to see because it's kind of interesting how that how that works. Right. I've always wanted to ask the people around me on the flight, like, how much did you pay for your ticket? How much did you pay? Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. All right. Who do we have today that's uh, that's needing some help? Um, how about GJ in Snohomish, Washington? He wanted to know a little bit more about that Amazon DVR that you were chatting about Ooh, yesterday. Amazon Had recast. Some questions. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's see if we can answer them. GJ, you're on with Rich. Thanks, Kim. Hello, GJ. Oh, here. Let me uh, let me do this. GJ, you there? Hi there. You're, you, first of all, you're doing a superb job filling oh, in for Leo. Thank you. As I'm I a, can't pull up the phone call. <laughs> I'm, I know it's hard because I'm a former computer talk show host. Uh, I had a show on KVTA in Ventura, and oh, wow. I, I used to live in Camarillo. I never miss a segment of yours on the KTLA Morning News for all the years I lived there. Well, thank you. And I uh, had my first tri-tip in my life in Camarillo. I oh, never yeah, heard of it from Jersey. I never, ever heard of it in my life. Went to my friend's yeah. house, and he grilled up this new type of meat I'd never heard of, and I've uh, been eating it ever since. Amazing. I moved, uh, I retired, and I moved up to Snohomish County, Washington a year ago. I only get to see you now on Saturdays and Sundays on Q13 KCPQ Weekend Morning News. So at least I get to see you twice a week still. That's that's good. That's a good fill. Yeah. <laughs> that might be more than some people can take. I'm, uh, I'm a good friend of Leo's on social media. Uh, a lot of the listeners know me as A Computer Pro on, on everything. It's a, with, with an A. A Computer Pro on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you name it. Um, and, um, but I did want to talk to you about this Amazon recast because it's the only item that I'm a little bit confused about as to what you can actually record. Well, you can record. So Amazon recast, we talked about this a little bit yesterday and it's a new DVR from Amazon that allows you to record over the air channels. So you set this thing up somewhere in your house. It's a little box. Um, you don't necessarily need a fire TV to go along with it, although that does help. But you can have this thing just by itself. It's $230. You hook up an antenna to it. So if you have an antenna on your roof like I do, that'd be great. You get all the channels, your local channels. And then if you have, um, if you don't have an antenna, you just put this thing in your house where you can kind of get some good signal and you plug in an antenna. Some of these antennas work inside your house. It feeds that live TV signal into the box. The box records it. You can do either two channels at once or four channels at once to record. They've got a, a one that holds 75 hours, 150 hours, but you can set recordings through, if you have a companion device like an Echo, you can set recordings using your voice or you can use the app on your phone or your tablet to set recordings, and it's all the local channels. So they're actually giving you the guide data for free, which is interesting, and it looks pretty. It looks like what you would see on the guide on your regular TV, and then you can stream these shows to all your devices through Wi-Fi. What do you think can about you record, that? Well, can you, can you record, uh, besides that, can you record the Amazon content, like stuff from... Um, from app, the Amazon apps that let you watch different channels, Hulu and, and, and so forth? You cannot do that. This is, this is a box that's kind of like a middle ground be, between the, you know, the cord cutters. And sometimes we, when you live somewhere, you don't necessarily have access to all the local channels on the cord cutting services like DirecTV Now or YouTube TV. It's gotten a lot better. But also, this is a lot cheaper than other solutions because personally, I have DirecTV Now. Um, I can ditch that because I can now just use this for all my local programming. And by the way, there's a ton of local programming, including sports, local news, and all kinds of network shows that you can record for free. And then I can supplement that with Amazon Prime, of course, on demand. I can watch my Netflix. Um, 
you know, your Hulu if you want to subscribe to that. You can get Sling TV to supplement. And the other thing is you, you can be more specific about what channels you want. Maybe you only care about ESPN, so you subscribe to the ESPN for five bucks a month, you know, whatever they have for that little package. But um, this, is, this has a lot of potential for a lot of cord cutting applications and a lot of folks that want to cut the cord but have been a little hesitant because they haven't they they still don't get that DVR functionality by cutting the cord and they want that and this really brings you that now I haven't tested this personally it's coming out in November again it's called the Fire TV recast but I have a feeling that this is going to be one of those products that will um that will have a place in our lives because we are so used to having a DVR for so long a lot of people are missing that they don't want to give up cable because they like that DVR with that ability to record a lot of stuff. It will not let you record things like HBO, cable channels. It is only for over the air with an antenna. GJ, thanks so much for your call from Washington today. And thanks so much for watching me, by the way, uh, both in L.A. and up there in uh, the Seattle area. Phone lines are open at 8888-ASK-LEO, 1-888-827-5536. Eric is in New Jersey. You have a question about switching your iPhone. What's going on, Eric? Yeah, um, I uh, I have an iPhone uh, seven. My wife has an iPhone six, and I'm thinking about getting a uh, a ten R in the next couple of months and uh, giving my wife the iPhone seven. Um, fairly simple question, I think, for you. Um, I'm really happy. With Touch ID, how it, it lets me get into my apps, particularly things like financial stuff and really se more sensitive apps. And I'm wondering whether the switch over to the other phone with Face ID is going to be a pain in the neck or whether um, it really happens almost automatically once I train the new phone, you know, with the Face ID. Is Do I, do I have to worry about checking with each app to make sure that it's going to switch over easily from touch ID to face ID. Well, the way it works with face ID, and this is a great question, it, it's pretty seamless. So the way face ID works, once you set it up on the phone once, your facial information is stored on that phone. It doesn't go to the cloud, doesn't go to a server, and it's only accessible on that device, right? And with the new phones, you can actually, with iOS 12, store two different faces. So if you need to share your device, you can um, that that's another option. But basically what happens is the first time that you log into one of these apps that normally took the fingerprint, it will say a prompt. It will say, would you like us to use Face ID to log in? Because usually with your bank, you log in with your username and your password. It will say after you do that, use Face ID. And once you approve access to Face ID, from now on, when you open up that banking app, it will be as if you're entering your username and password just by opening up that app tapping face ID and it will magically scan your face, make sure that it's you and it will open up that app. And I find that almost every app works this way. Almost every app that had the fingerprint sensor has now switched over to face ID. And to answer your question, Eric, it works nicely. Um, I did not want to believe that Face ID would be as good as Touch ID. In many cases, it's better because it's more convenient. You can look right at your phone, unlock things. Um, I do wish we had the option for both, but that's just not what's happening on the iPhones anymore. But I think you're going to be fine. I think you'll be very happy with the 10R as an upgrade from the iPhone 7. Eric in New Jersey, uh, my home state. Thanks for calling in to The Tech Guy. I'm Rich Demiro, Leo Laporte on vacation. Filling in and taking your questions at 8888-ASK-LEO, 888-827-5536. Give me a call. Let's talk tech. All right, folks, hopefully you're enjoying the show. Uh, I'm having a great time. This is uh, coming to the end for me because uh, Leo is back in town. So uh, he will be back, uh, I think, tonight for Twit. So um, anyway, let's, uh, let's hear from Leo. Let's get a little preview from Leo. He'll say hi to you guys right now. This episode of The Tech Guy is brought to you kind of literally by JW Player, the most powerful, flexible HTML5 video platform. We were ready to get rid of Flash on our website a long time ago and decided on JW Player. If you go to twit.tv slash TTG or twit.tv 
slash MBW, or if any of our shows, you watch the podcast, the video shows, you'll be using JW Player. You wouldn't know it because we, you know, customize it to look like ours. That's one of the things I love about JW Player. You know, on some other sites, you know, you see that YouTube branding, that's kind of chintzy. I don't like that. Um, that's an ad for YouTube, not you. JW Player is awesome. Plus, it's HTML5. You've probably seen it a million times. You might not know. Half a million websites use JW Player to deliver videos to their audiences, including the Washington Post, Business Insider, Vice. These brands use it because it can be customized to meet their exact needs, to match their brand, give you a seamless video experience on their website. And I think that's so important. From small businesses that are ready to upgrade from YouTube to large-scale publishers and broadcasters like us, who want to maximize video ad fill rates and CPMs, JW Player has a perfect solution for every business. It is literally one of the most important features of our website is the ability to watch our shows on the site. And thank goodness for JW Player. We've tried other uh, players. There's nothing better. This is it. This is the best. If you are ready to take control and upgrade your video experience, you got to check out JW Player at jwplayer.com. It's the fastest player, buffer-free technology, fully customizable to match your brand. They do offer a video CMS, content management system, for uploading and managing your videos, a powerful and easy-to-use suite of APIs to enhance player functionality and access video analytics. We do use that. For publishers who run video ads, maximize your fill rates, maximize your CPMs. And right now, you get 50% off, 5 zero, half off, Half off your business subscription. Go to jwplayer.com slash twit and use the code twit. This is a very limited time exclusive offer. you got to do it right now. So if you're playing back video on your website, you need to do this. jwplayer.com slash twit. Use the offer code twit for half off. jwplayer.com slash twit. Use the offer code twit. And we thank them for putting out that Tech Guy podcast and all of our other shows. Thank you, JW Player. Now back to the show. Welcome back to The Tech Guy. I'm Rich Demuro, filling in for Leo Laporte today, taking your calls at 8888-ASK-LEO, 1-888-827-5536. Give me a call. We'll talk about technology, whatever you need. Maybe you need an app recommendation, something's bugging you, something's just not working right, or maybe you bought something that you love and you want to share the, the love with everyone on the radio and let them know. We'll take your calls at 888-827-5536. My name is Rich DeMiro. Like I said, I'm the tech reporter at KTLA Channel 5 in Los Angeles. I love just helping people with technology. I love telling them about technology, covering this stuff. been a nerd for a long time, and this is definitely one of my favorite topics. I know a lot of people talk sports on the weekends. I talk tech, and whether people like it or not, that's what I'm talking about. You can learn more about me at richontech.tv. We've got you on the line. Let's see here. Let's go to uh, Linda in Colorado. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing great. You said you've been hacked? Yeah. Uh-oh, oh, what happened? My, I don't know. I would log in or try to log on and say that ad, email address no longer exists. Email address no longer exists? What? Basically, yeah. What What Long email time. provider? Google. Two of them on Google and my email address on Yahoo now as well. And Were you using the same password? Yeah. Well, no, for both of them, no. I would switched those out. How do you think they got your account information? I don't know. The, uh, the first one started getting hacked last summer, and I was fighting with Google on it back and forth. Because I had to get uh, a new address anyway, so I went ahead and went with Google, like an idiot. And the um, for the first six months, it was okay. And then August or September, I started noticing a bunch of other mail coming in for some guy. And it's like, okay, this is not cool. And then it, the password got changed on top of it. Okay. And I switched it out and then started, uh, sent a letter to him, told him what was going on. I said, find out who was doing this and get him off of there. You sent a letter? 
Well, I, an email to Yahoo or to Google. And did they respond I, to you? Just on the website. I, I haven't been able to get a physical address for them yet. To well, I think I think letter. I think uh, sending something through email is probably faster. So, what? How are you accessing your email accounts? Where are you accessing these from? Well, at that point in time, it'd been at, uh, either at church when I was working online for them, mm, or okay. shared computer. Secu- well, it was a secure line though for the church, but the other one was uh, the library. Oh, okay. Okay, so. Uh, Linda, 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 um, here's the thing. So all of your accounts are gone. Did you have anything important in these email accounts? Yeah, unfortunately. You did. Okay. Legal stuff. What is it? Legal. Legal stuff. stuff. Okay. Here. <laughs> well, <laughs> someone else uh, knows your business at this point, Linda. So mm-hmm. here's, here's the thing. Number one, um, you may or may not be able to get these accounts back because they, you know, if these people got your account and you you said they got multiple accounts, that that is not a good thing. So that means that they got your password for your, your Yahoo and your Gmail. So you need to go to Google and go to the account recovery page. And if you basically just Google uh, Gmail hacked or hijacked and you look at that support page, it will give you some things to do. And you may have already done this the first time when your account was hacked the last time, but this is what you need to do. And you may or may not be able to recover it. Um, These things can take a while because guess what? They've got tens of millions of Gmail accounts out there, perhaps uh, a billion Gmail accounts. And, uh, you know, I get it. It's important to you, but you're you're a number to Google with this. And I I don't want to be, make it sound like this is not important to them, but this is this is one account, and of course, it's the most important account because it's your account. So you want to get these things back. So go to that page, follow the steps. You're gonna probably have to put in your you know your email, a password that you used to use. They may want to confirm who you are via a text message. But my advice to you and to anyone that is using email is this, and we talked about this earlier today. Number one, Linda, you got to set up two-factor authentication. That means that when you log into your Google account or your Yahoo account, you're going to get a text message that says, hey, did you just log in? And if it says, did you just log in from Moscow, Russia, you say no. (laughs) And next thing you know, they will be blocked out of logging into your account. That's number one. You have to do that if you set up a new account. Number two, you got to be careful about shared computers. When I did an interview with Google and I talked to their Chrome security team, the people that make the web browser, they said number one rule ever of the internet, never, ever log into an account on a public or shared computer. They would never do that. And that includes hotel lobbies, which are the worst, notorious. Now, they've gotten a lot better. I've noticed a lot of the systems now will automatically log everything out and refresh the system. But this is coming from Google. And that's what they told me. And I, this really, I took this to heart because it's stuck with me ever since. Library computer, you don't know what kind of security they have there. You don't know who logged in before. Shared computer at church, sure, church is a nice place, but you don't know who's using that computer. You don't know what they've downloaded to that computer. There could be a keylogger. There could be malware. Something was stealing your information. And the fact that you were hacked on two accounts is pretty scary. So... That's my advice. You got to use the account recovery. It may or may not work, Linda. I hope it does for your sake because you want to get these email accounts back. But if you don't and you have to set up a new one, you got to you got to put these password security measures in place, which is two-factor authentication and do not do not reuse the same password twice because like you said, they probably got your password for one of these things and they immediately went to your other one. And that's the scary part is that these people, once they have access to the first one, they go right to the second one. Wow. Linda, Linda, Linda. Oh my gosh. I don't want to ever hear that because it's scary when you think about how much stuff we store on our computers. You know what I mean? You just don't want to think about losing all that stuff. And Gmail is not just email. It's your Google account, which is linked to Drive, which has your photos and your documents uh, it's linked to you know your YouTube, and it's linked to anything that you use with Google. It's become kind of like a, a second skin for many of us to have these accounts from these providers that we're getting for free. 
So the customer service is not always there. So we have to become our own best advocates when it comes to protecting our data. And in the future, it might be nice if you know, some of these companies pay us because they're making money off of our data. That's how Google makes money is off of us. So in the future, maybe that will change. But right now, we get this stuff for free. And the agreement is that we got to take care of it because you're not going to be able to find a phone number to call someone to get help with your Gmail hacking. That's for sure. 8888-ASK-LEO. 1-888-827-5536. Dial me up. Let's talk tech. Welcome back to The Tech Guy. Rich DeMuro in today for Leo Laporte. Leo will be back next week. In the meantime, I'm taking your calls at 1-8888-ASK-LEO. 1-8888-ASK-LEO. Sue is on the line in Sacramento. Sue, what's going on? Yes, I bought a Roku TV and I followed the directions uh, to log on online and set up an account, but it got all messed up and things were grayed out. And I'm wondering if it's because I only have DSL. What do you mean it got messed up? You know, it's been several days since I did it. Um, It just wouldn't accept, um, it wouldn't. I I did the bot thing, you know, to prove that I wasn't a bot, and um, they didn't Roku explain. didn't think you were human. Could be, but I'm wondering if my um, if a if a Roku TV can work on a DSL service. Is that the real issue, or do you have any tips for me to? Well, what try? do you know? How fast can you're? I'm, well, okay, you're, there's two separate things going on here. So you said you tried to create a Roku account. So right. you did that at the website, right? Right. Uh, so that's at my.roku.com, right? And you click create account. Yes. Actually, when I went back to check, um, I have had a default Avast account um, default browser that's coming up for me. And I didn't notice, but I tried it on the Avast. No, don't don't do it on that. Do it on. Do you have Chrome or do you have what? What kind of computer are you using? I have Chrome. Yeah. Okay. You I go to Chrome. Laptop. Go on Chrome. Mm-hmm. Go on. You know Roku.com, and where it says create account. Um, first off, just say forgot password and type in your email address and see if you can recover your password. Have you tried that? Um, I did, and and it kept giving me like a new kind of substantiation thing to prove that I wasn't a bot. I'm not even sure I got to the password. Okay. So I I think I must have. Okay. So what I would do is I think that uh, number one, DSL should be fine. I mean, it depends. Now you're talking about setting up an account that's separate from streaming. Streaming. Yeah. There might be some buffering depending on how fast your DSL account is. Um, But that should not prohibit you from setting up an account. So I would go to roku.com um, just click create account and you need to, you know, come up with a nice password, come up with a, you know, an email address. If you've already used your email address and you think that's not working, try a separate email address. Like maybe you have a secondary one, try that, create your Roku account. Then you, you do have to put in, um, you know, payment method. If you want to do channel store purchases, um, your contact information, it should just be a pretty standard workflow. Now, if you're running into problems with that, there could be something on your machine that is interfering with this process. Could be an ad blocker. It could be third-party software. You said you have an Avast browser. That's a little troubling to me. So I would go through on Windows and I would actually uninstall any programs that you do not recognize or you don't know what they are. So if you're sitting there and you see some program that says, you know, browser helper or ad server, get rid of those. And that could be prohibiting you from actually making this sign up process work because it sounds like something is intercepting your sign up. And that's why it's asking you to do the, the bot thing, because generally, um, you know, there might be a click that says, you know, I'm not a robot, but that's pretty standard. So um, it sounds like there's something more going on here. But to answer your original question, you should be just fine with DSL and Roku TV. And by the way, the Roku TVs are super popular. And uh, congrats on getting that because they are pretty great. So um, I just visited with Roku this week in Los Angeles. And they've got some great stuff coming out, including wireless speakers for your TV that are really, really nice. So um, 
Uh, good choice on the Roku TV. A lot of people are buying those. I think they've done a good job. Ron is in uh, Sherman Oaks. Ron, you're on with Rich. Rich, <clears throat> you're way better than Leo. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're kidding because Leo's watching. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I watch you all the time down here in uh, Los Angeles. Thank you. Uh, I've got two questions. The first is I have a an ancient Samsung Note 3 on Ting. I want to upgrade, but I'm thinking of Google Pixel 3 or Samsung Note 9. Now, Note 9, they're using an older uh, uh, Android system. Uh, it's not Pi. And Google 3, well, it's vaporware because it's not announced yet. That's number one. Number two, I purchased a 2018 Apple iPod 128 gigabyte, and I spent 20 hours trying to establish an Apple ID on my own personal email address. They won't do it anymore. They force me to go to uh, iCloud. They want you to sign up with theirs. Okay, so how can I help you? Uh, let's start with the uh, phone. So you want to know, you have a Note 3, and you want to know which one to get, the Pixel the Pixel 3 or the Note 9? Correct. Oh, that's tough. I, <laughs> What do you want to do? I mean, I love the Pixel. That's one of my all-time favorite devices. So I've had the Pixel 1. Uh, I've had the Pixel 2. I can't wait for the Pixel 3. The Pixel is a one-trick pony. Uh, it has the best software. Well, it's a two-trick pony. It's got the best software, Right. And it's got the best camera. That's it. Other than that, it's a boring device. Now, will we get wireless charging with the Pixel Three? Perhaps. Um, I don't. Re- it's a great device. It's just like I said, it's a boring device. So I like boring. okay, boring I is like, boring I don't is like nice. People watching over my shoulder. Well, and I don't think with the Note Nine you're going to have that. So I've been using the Note Nine uh, for since it came out. And the Note 9, the advantages there is that you get a lot of software advantages. So, yes, they're not running the latest version of Android, which is currently called Pi. It's still running Android 8, which is the last version. It's fine. That is not a huge deal. Android 9, of course, is going to have some little tweaks here and there. But overall, it does not affect the performance of the system, and it's still pretty good. So the thing that you get with the, with the Note 9 is you get the stylus, which I really like. Um, I think that that's really handy. You get the dual camera setup, which is kind of fun to have. You can zoom into things uh, by tapping one button, and you can go twice as close to things that you're taking pictures of or video. Um, And there has been a problem with bloatware in the past on Samsung devices, a lot of extra software. I do not find that to be the case anymore. So I think that uh, the manufacturers and if you buy it unlocked which is the way i recommend buying it you you really don't have any bloatware on there so i think samsung devices are running very nicely these days especially the note 9 and it's a it's a beautiful device it just really comes down to personal preference do you want something that has like a little bit extra it's like getting like a sports car versus kind of a basic mode of transportation both are going to get you there the samsung's going to do it with a little more flair um personally no matter what you do ron you got to just wait until we hear about this thing, right? So October 9th is when they're going to announce the Pixel 3. I'll be there in New York City for that, and uh, we'll see what that's all about. I can't see it adding anything that exciting besides the camera. And don't get me wrong, I love the camera. But again, it's kind of a boring device other than the camera. Does that help? Yes, that helps a lot. Uh, Now, I read that uh, Samsung is pushing a new... Uh, uh, software type thing. I can't find it right now. Oh yeah, the so- the experience, the, the Samsung experience. They're always kind of evolving it. And yes, the Samsung experience, which is kind of their their special software on top of Android, that will evolve with the Note Nine when they launch the new version of Android on that device. That usually takes a while with Samsung. We could be looking at another three to six months for that. Ron, great question. I think you're going to be very happy with either of those devices. Rich DeMiro here for Leo Laporte today. More of your calls at 888-827-5536. Chris Marcourt, up next. You're out. Great job. Thank you. Okay. Chris, you there. I hear you. Or I see you. That's good. You hear me too? I hear you. 
Good. Good, good, good. Uh, Chris, how do I... Tell me how to spell your last name. Uh, Marquardt. M-A-R. Q-U-A-R-D-T. Oh, D-T. Okay, that's why. There we go. Don't ask me where that D comes from. I know, that's what threw me off. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, tips from the top floor, right? That's the website to talk about? That's the, web, that's the website. Tips from the top floor is also my podcast. Um, and I just spent uh, 10 days with a group of 11 photographers in Norway, in Lofoten, for a photo tour. So what I'm bringing back is some photos. And uh, two photo tips, one about how to shoot the northern lights, the aurora. Ooh. And the second one is <clears throat> how to shoot eagles in flight. How to shoot eagles in flight? Yep. Wow. Which is what we did one day. Now, do you go to a place so, where there's a lot of eagles? Yeah, of course. <laughs> they don't, They don't like, send them up? <laughs> well, they, they are wild eagles, but, of course, there's a, there's a guy on the ship well, we, we go there in, in, on, a, on, a, on a speedboat, and there's a guy on a ship who has a bucket of fish, so he's trying to lure them in, which is pretty much the way you do these kind of things. Wow. That's kind of fun. Yeah, it was, it was fun. It was good. It was a lot of fun. I could see the New Yorker cartoon right now where it would have the one guy like with a gun be like, what? And all the rest of you have your cameras. I thought we were shooting eagles. <laughs> There's a lot of very military uh, language in photography, for sure. Mm. There's cameras with rangefinders, which comes from, I think, cannons. Um, you shoot. You have uh, rapid fire oh, on your yeah. camera. Oh, my God. You're, you're carrying around a little army in your pocket. It's oh. interesting. I, I wonder how the search engines do that or how the uh, NSA does uh, the the distinct how they distinguish between photographers and gun nuts that's so how true how do they do that, that because is... we use very similar language well i'm i'm going to shoot babies today i mean <laughs> that is yeah that is interesting there must be a lot of false positives on when they scan like text messages you know like with the well, well here in the us just have, you know they might just have your profile stamped as a photographer and that's, that's interesting though i mean yeah. that's really, well, I always really say, a, tough, a tough challenge for for the search engines uh you know with my job we're always going out on shoots and so i always say we're shooting this <clears throat> we're shooting that and then if i say sure. something like we're, we have a shoot at a school like i hate to say that so i never you know i kind of i catch myself because what's the what's the alternative you say we're we going to <laughs> film we're gonna go yeah we're gonna go record a segment that's what i'll say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, of course. I mean, you know, it has it has connotations for sure. Yeah. Welcome back to the Tech Guy, Rich Demiro, sitting in for Leo Laporte today. What's going on? We're talking technology. We're talking photography. Fun subject. I know we all have these cameras in our pockets with our cell phones, but Chris Marcourt has much more. Just got back from a eleven day photo trip. Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, Rich, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Where did you go on this trip and what did you take pictures of? <laughs> so I uh, took a, f a group of 11 photographers up, to, uh, 11, 10, I think 10 together, we were 11, up to Norway, to the Lofoten Archipelago, which is right above the Arctic Circle. And we went there and spent, uh, yeah, 11 days on the islands there, just driving around, finding good spots to do photography and Shooting up there is really easy because you have like pretty much you can park the car anywhere you like. You have a good shot. The light is amazing. The landscape is amazing. The, everything is great up there. So uh, that's what we did. We spent time and, and explored the entire area there and had good food while we were up there because the fish is just wonderful up there. If you're not a, if you're not a fan of fish, you will become one. It's almost <laughs> a given. Um, and then we had two two things that were kind of high on the list. And um, apart from the fishermen's huts and just the the way the the mountains interact with the sea there, and two things we we, we went to shoot were uh, the aurora, the northern lights, and we did an eagle safari, a sea eagle safari, which was on a speedboat. We went out and. Uh, try to capture pictures of sea eagles. So 
Uh, I'd like to just spend a few minutes on, yeah, maybe giving a few tips if any of the listeners wants to go to any of these places that do these two things. So let's start with the Aurora Borealis, or if you're all the way in the south, in the Antarctic, the Aurora Australis. Um, both are a bit of a challenge to, to shoot, a bit of a technical challenge. And uh, if you see them, you rarely see them in video. And the reason is because they're quite faint, or they can be quite faint. Mm, so they're, okay. they're now with a, with, a, with a faster sensor, so the higher ISOs that you can get with some of the cameras, it's getting easier to get like a real-time video, but often you just get a series of longer exposures. So you, and we're talking, you set this thing up for a while, huh? Oh, you set this thing up on a tripod. You you need a wide lens, and what I'm using is like a 14 millimeter lens on a full frame camera. So you cover a quite a big range because the aurora is usually it covers a lot of the sky, and you want as much as you can. And um, then there's just a, like a good starting point for the aurora up there is uh, ISO 1600. Put the lens, if you have, as wide as possible as in like f2.8, if you can, and expose for 20 seconds. That's kind of the starting point where, uh, from where you can kind of take it. Now, And that'll give you an, init an initial exposure. I know you guys are doing this on, on really professional, great cameras. Could you use those settings on a smartphone that no, has pro no. settings? No, not really. That, no. Not really. Unfortunately, that does not work with a smartphone you want a mirrorless camera at least one that you can go manual on so you have manual exposure you can set all these exposure uh, bits manually and you, on your smartphone you are kind of limited uh, when it comes to that also the the sensor in the smartphone is is rather small so if we're talking about 20 second long exposures you will end up with a very noisy picture so probably better to use a uh a bit of a more advanced camera. But again, mirrorless cameras, Micro Four Thirds will do the trick. They will be just fine. The pictures are incredible, by the way. So how, I mean, they're just amazing to see the green Thank in you. the sky and the way it's lit up. How different is it in real life versus what you capture? You know, I mean, with the human eye versus the lens. The camera does see more than than your eye in this case because your eye doesn't do a 20 second exposure. So you, you, you get a bit, the, the picture shows it a bit brighter than it actually is. It's a bit more faint. Uh, but then I've also seen auroras that were as bright as on the photos. So it kind of depends. But these were more like, yeah, just a bit more shy. Um, one thing you have to learn, that, that's why it is kind of advanced, is you have to learn to kind of operate your camera in the dark. Because Ooh, yeah. <laughs> if you if you have a headlamp on um, to, to illuminate the thing, you might be illuminating something in another photographer's shot if if there's other photographers around you so it's it's um i, I kind of i kind of trained for that i practiced for that uh with the, the lens that i have is a manual focus lens and i put little stickers on it that i can feel in the dark so i i I, during daytime, I figured out what is infinite exposure. Where do I have to turn the focus ring to to have that camera on whatever the aurora will be, be later? Same with the aperture. Put a little sticker on, and now I can feel on the lens where I have to turn it. So that one is uh, pretty good. And then, yeah, you take the exposure. Oh, another tip. Turn down the brightness of your camera display. If, the, if it doesn't do that automatically, you want to turn it down because if you don't, if you have it set so you can see it well in the sun, and if you look at that display on your camera in the dark, it'll blind you. You won't see anything after that. So uh, it's much easier to work with a display that is turned all the way down. Mm. And then, again, take that exposure and check it on the display, and then just iterate from there, make it a bit longer, make it a bit shorter, depending on what the brightness of the aurora is. Amazing, amazing results, Chris. Um, let's talk about capturing the eagles. <laughs> eagles in flight we did a we did a sea eagle safari and um that is another technically challenging one what you want to do is you want to set the camera on autofocus you want to set set it to all focus points on so that it automatically chooses 
which is the best one? You want to set it to continuous autofocus, also sometimes known as servo autofocus. So while you shoot, it keeps tracking the subject. And if the subject comes closer or moves away from, uh, from the camera, it will keep the focus on it as good as it can. And then set the camera to rapid fire, to shoot as many pictures as possible in a short time. And whenever one of these eagles swoops down to catch a fish, they will, yeah, you will you just follow it and go click, 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 click as fast as your camera can do. I ended up, after two hours of doing this, I ended up with 800 photos. 800? Well, 800 photos in the can, but 10 of those were like the keepers, the good ones. So you have a lot of stuff that you have to throw away after this kind of a photo session. And that's how you do it. <laughs> Where do you start going through all those pictures? That's that's a lot of pictures to go through. I mean, that's part of that's half the job, right? Well, it, you have to you have to work on your workflow. You have to get your workflow right to get those pictures into the computer and then uh, figure out rather quickly which one you want to keep, which ones you don't, which ones you might want to crop, which ones you might want to work on. But yeah, 10 photos was kind of the the result of that which I'm quite happy with. I've seen other photographers taking more pictures and getting less out of that. So, yeah, again, a, a matter of practice, a little bit a matter of the camera in this case as well. It's technically quite challenging. So if you have a camera that can shoot more pictures faster, you will simply increase your chances of uh, getting an interesting one. Chris, uh, amazing photos. Where can folks see these? You've painted such a nice picture. Now we want to see them. Where can we go? <laughs> Uh, the best place to go is to tipsfromthetopfloor.com. In the that's my podcast. In the current episode, I talk about the uh, the Norway uh, photo tour, and there's also a link to the photos there. All right, Chris, and on my Twitter at Rich Demuro, I tweeted a picture I took of a bird in San Francisco with my cell phone uh, two years ago on an HTC 10. I want you to take a look at that and tell me how I did because I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> it got him right in flight. So, uh, Chris Marquardt, thanks so much for joining me on the Tech Guy. Rich Demuro in for Leo Laporte. We're going to take more of your calls at 8888-ASK-LEO, 1-888-827-5536. You got something you want to talk about with tech? Give me a call. Thanks, Chris. That was great. Thank you. The pigeon photos are amazing. That's a great photo. <laughs> Isn't that pretty you, good for for, well, a, for a you, cell phone? Well, yeah, absolutely. And you did the right thing. You were quick on your feet. You took the camera up and took that photo while things happened. Many people go, oh, let me take the camera out of my bag and take the lens cap off and so on. With a smartphone bang you there and it's a good it's a good camera a good photo yeah i was impressed with that for for you know it's sometimes these little cameras will surprise you you know what i mean um now do you shoot on like any smartphone stuff like are you familiar with like iphone stuff just to kind oh, of yeah, totally, compare totally. so i have this app called halide have you heard of that i have that and i use that yes and, what do you and think i shoot of that? in raw yeah i shoot in raw set it to raw if you have something that can read raw files like lightroom mobile for example um, you can get a lot more out of that than out of your JPEG photos. And you can... And Halide is amazing. And you can adjust everything, huh? Well, there. especially especially exposure. I mean, that's kind of the most important thing. Um, when you slide your finger left and right, you uh, slide the exposure up and down so the picture gets brighter and darker. Right. And uh, if, you, if you can turn on the histogram and... Oh, okay. And what's learn, that telling Learn me? to read the histogram. It tells you the uh, statistics over the brightness in your picture. So oh, my gosh. There's so left, much. Left to right is black to white. And the the y-axis pretty much shows you how many of those brightness pixels are there. If you swipe it left and right, just make sure it isn't cut off to the left or the right. And then you have a good exposure. Wow, that's so interesting. Um, oh, yeah. So so a lot of stuff happens on screen with this. I didn't realize that. Um, and oh, so, and it, it has yeah. these amazing haptics. When you turn the camera and it clicks when you are vertical or horizontal. So it'll give you the little tap when... Uh, not sure if you have to enable that, but oh, that's uh, cool. like if, if you want to keep the horizon level then oh. you just follow that little tap and then you take the photo oh that's really cool all right i gotta i gotta dive into this more is that new kind of for the iphone all because iphone doesn't offer manual controls by itself it, this is kind of a, like is that new is that recent that they've allowed that the api allows that but um only the shutter speed and the iso because the aperture isn't 
doesn't, I think, change. I think it's only one aperture. Maybe the latest iPhones have a changeable aperture, but... I don't think so. I know um, Samsung does with theirs, but I don't think the iPhone does. But they offer an API for that. So uh, cameras, camera apps have been doing that. You can do this on the regular uh, iPhone Photos app, by the way. If you take a photo, if you want to take a photo, right next to that yellow box mm -hmm. that tells you where it where it uh, focused for, Right. there's a little sun symbol. Swipe that up or down. Wait, right next to the box... Oh, I right see what you're saying. Box. Oh, when you focus, oh, that little sun. Okay, so that's the aperture. That's the uh, what did that's, you say? That's the exposure, exposure in general. Okay, so, so you can manually. If something is too bright or too dark, you can just fix it that way before you take the photo. Oh, great! Oh, yeah, very cool. That's really Lots fun. To play with. Yeah, it's amazing. This stuff. Uh, those pictures were really amazing. So good job. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds like the trip was worth it. <laughs> it definitely was. Now, do you All hang right. on and talk to these folks, or are you you out of here? You done? Uh, I'm I'm gonna be a bit longer in the chat room. Okay. Then I'll go to bed. It's uh, it's almost ten here. Oh my gosh. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, molecule. All right, Chris. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Welcome back to the Tech Guy, Rich Demiro in for Leo Laporte. Phone lines are open at 8888-ASK-LEO, 1-888-827-5536. Todd is in San Diego. Todd, you're on with Rich. Hey, Rich. Thanks for taking my call. Hey, thanks for calling in. What's going on? So um, I saw your report on the new Apple products, and I'm an Android guy. One of the questions that I have is, if you know or if you think that in the next generation of the Samsung devices, they might incorporate that EKG monitor that the iWatch has in their next-gen Samsung watch. That's a good question. And um, thanks for watching the report, by the way. Um, Fox 5 San Diego, I'm guessing. So the EKG was one of the really interesting functions that they added to the Apple Watch. So you now have two kind of, um, I don't know if you call them diodes or whatever. There's two contact points on the Apple Watch, the new Series 4. One is on the crown, the digital crown as they call it, and then one is on the back of the, of the device. So that one hits your wrist and then you take your other hand and you tap your finger on the digital crown for 30 seconds, hold it there while it takes a reading. And it will take a reading of your EKG or ECG um, for your heart. And it will actually come out with a little printout that you can PDF mail to your doctor and say, hey, here's what I decided. Um, or here's what my, my watch detected. Take a look at it. You know, here's what it gave. So it's a pretty interesting feature. Um, you know, people are debating whether it's helpful, whether it's not helpful. Is there a reason why you want this feature? Is there um, something that you like about it in particular? Well, uh, I have family history of cardiac issues. My oldest brother um, actually had a internal defibrillator placed. Um, so it's potentially something that could be helpful for me because in the past, there have been times when I've had the feeling of my heart racing. Um, so I think along with the normal uh, health track monitors that the new watches have, it's a helpful, uh, it's just more information that you can have. So it's, if it works and if it's accurate, I would actually be willing to switch back to Apple products if this was some kind of propri uh, proprietary uh, software that Apple has that Samsung might not be able to get to. Well, I think there's there's a chance that Samsung could build something in that's similar. I mean, remember, Samsung was one of the first that came out with the heart rate sensor on the back of their phone, which would take, I think it was like your, your oxygen level. And I think it also did your heart rate as well on the back of their devices. So they were doing this way before Apple was. I just don't think they've really progressed it as far as Apple has taken it. With that said... It's funny how we see these things happen where one company does something and the next thing you know, five other companies do something very similar. So now that it's been done, I don't see any reason why another company wouldn't want to do it. With that said, Todd, for you specifically, since you say you have a family history and all that stuff, I think it, it might be um, 
a good idea to look into this. And if you're open to switching and to get this thing, it could be potentially life-saving. Now, there's another feature, by the way, and you mentioned, you said, you know, the heart racing thing. There's another feature that's kind of interesting inside the app. Now, the ECG feature is coming later this year. So that is not available just yet. But there is a feature that is available right now, and they did add something new. And these are heart rate notifications. So if you have an Apple Watch, even an older model, and you updated to the new Watch OS 5, which came out on Monday, by the way, there is now a high heart rate notification and a low heart rate notification. So you can set your Apple Watch to let you know when your heart rate gets to a certain point that's high or low. And they used to only have one of these, and now they've added both, the high and the low. And right now, mine by default is at 40 for the low and 120 for the high. Of course, you can talk to your doctor and set those to what you think you need. And of course, Todd, they also mentioned the fall detection. So I agree. I think this is a very compelling feature set on the Apple Watch Series 4 that people are really, are really thinking could be a big lifesaver. And especially yeah. if you have something in your family that, that like a history of a heart condition and, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think I'm not going to say just switch because of this. I think you need to wait to see when it comes out, see kind of what the feeling is, what doctors are saying, what people are saying about it. But we've already know that the Apple watch is saving lives in general from all the stories we've heard about people using it to call and when they're stuck and this and that. So I think that, uh, you know, if you are interested for personal and health reasons, it, it'd probably be pretty interesting to look into it and, and consider switching. And Rich, one last question. Do you know when Samsung comes out with their new product? So I think they just came out with their next generation uh, Samsung Watch 4, I think. Yeah. Um, so would it be like six months or a year from now? Uh, it, it'd probably be another year. So, I mean, it just, they just came out with the Samsung galaxy watch and they just came out with the new Samsung, uh, galaxy note nine in August. So those were both unveiled in August and put on sale, uh, just recently. So I would say we probably have another year before a refresh with Samsung. So in that time, you will have a good amount of time to kind of consider switching and I say, just kind of, just kind of watch this because it, it, you know, it's not the first device. If you want a portable device that can do this, you can get those. I don't think any of them are as good or as convenient as the Apple watch seems to be. So, um, great question, Todd, because I think a lot of people are eyeing that Apple watch for this reason. And it's one of these things where it's like, you almost feel like, oh, I, I need that because why wouldn't I have that? Because it's available and you know about it. It's almost like if I don't have it, I put myself as a disadvantage. And clearly that's all part of marketing from Apple. Um, but at the same time, if you do have a problem, it could really help. Rich DeMiro sitting in for Leo Laporte today. And I love gadgets. I love new gadgets. And Gillette, instead of adding another razor to their latest razor, you know, another blade, they are actually going to add heat so I don't know if you ever had the um, hot towel before a shave, but this is the heated razor that they are now testing. So I'm a sucker for all these razors. You know, they add the extra blades and more and more and more. We're, I don't even know how many, how many they're up to. But uh, this one just has the standard blades, but they've added this little heat strip. And it kind of looks like a bigger version of your typical razor you know, handle. So it's got to hold all those elements and things in there. But you press this button on the razor and it takes less than a second to heat up this warming bar to either 113 or 120 degrees, 22 degrees Fahrenheit, which they've done the research. And I guess it's not going to burn your face, but it's going to feel really good. Almost like you've got that hot towel before you shave. So this product, they, they're not just going to come out with it. They're actually doing it on Indiegogo. So they're seeing how many people are interested because you ready for the price tag? $150. Now it's funny because if you buy a four pack of razors from them, it's probably like 30, but this is 150. They're going to try it for 45 days crowdfunding, and then they're going to put it in the marketplace February, 2019. So that's the news from Gillette on the new heated razor. They're always trying to come up with a new way uh, to get the razor kind of advanced with technology. So heat is the next step. 
Rich Demiro in for Leo Laporte. You are listening to The Tech Guy. We're going to take more of your calls at 8888-ASK-LEO, 1-888-827-5536. Give me a call. Uh, okay, thanks so much for uh, chatting in the chat room, listening, watching, whatever you're doing. I know some of you guys were uh, chatting it up with Leo in there, so that's awesome. It sounds like he's back on uh, ground here. But uh, let's bring on Leo to uh, to actually talk to you guys. Hey, Leo. If I may interrupt Rich, by the way, thank you, Rich, for filling in. I appreciate it. Uh, Rich DeMuro from KTLA. Uh, I will be back next week. Actually, I'll be back later in the day to do Twit. I'm, 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 I just got home. I'm exhausted. <laughs> so I'm going to let Rich finish this show. But I will be back later in the day for Twit and, the, of course, next week for the Tech Guy show. Um, I wanted to stop by and talk about Carbonite because I am the expert. I've used it for years. You've heard me talk about it for years. And lately, you probably heard us talk about it as the data protection platform for business. And that's really important. If you're in business, your data, is, it's more than backup. You need to protect your data. It's backup, but it's disaster recovery. It's high availability. It's workload migration technology. So there's no lock-in. You can move from hybrid to cloud to on-prem and back to different cloud systems, all with the help of Carbonite. You got it. Oh, the newest thing is a Carbonite endpoint backup. This is something a lot of businesses have endpoints all over the place. You know, it's it's a bring your own device world. You've got you've got employees and users with your data on their stuff, their phone, their tablet, their computer. If if your data is spread out, you need hybrid backup and archiving that safeguards data at user endpoints but doesn't kill your network. Carbonite endpoint backup. That's the answer. It's the only endpoint backup featuring true global deduplication of encrypted data. The reason is Carbonite patented this. It's very clever what they've done. Whenever two users have the same file, maybe 200 have the same file, Carbonite's algorithms make sure that file is only on the vault once. That saves you space, that saves you network bandwidth, that saves you money. Of course it's secure. 256-bit encryption at rest. Each data set has, and this is interesting, each data set has its own encryption key, which helps protect all your data from cyber attacks, and each key is just for a snippet of the file. So even if somebody would somehow, weirdly, to get a copy of that key, they'd only get a small piece of the file. That's the key to the deduplication, too. And I don't care how big your enterprise is, Carbonite Endpoint Backup will scale for you. It covers up to 2 million endpoints in one vault, and you can use as many vaults as you need. That's infinite, right? Carbonite Endpoint Backup offers maximum flexibility. You can deploy it in the public cloud if you want. You can deploy it in the private cloud. You can deploy it on-premises. You can combine it. You'll love their quick cache. This is something only Carbonite has. It backs up small data sets locally throughout the day over the LAN. So that means it's local, and restore speed's 10 times faster, backup is faster, minimum bandwidth disruption. But, of course, eventually you can put it on the cloud if you want as well. Carbonite Endpoint Backup also enables remote wipe. So if an uh, employee has your data out there, you can get, you know, you can clear it off. Gives you peace of mind. Not just for laptops. Carbonate makes phone and tablet backup easy, too. You get centralized management, so you set retention and access policies easily. You can delay backup if, the, for instance, a phone's on cellular or battery. You can wait till they're connected up. Rapid access for end users to any file backed up across any endpoint. I, I, I can go on and on. Look at you got to do this. Learn more about Carbonite Endpoint Backup. One place to go, Carbonite.com. Love these guys. Carbonite.com. We use it. Everybody should use it. Now back to Rich and the tech guy. Thank you, Rich. Well, thank you, Leo. Uh, yeah, Leo is uh, back. So you guys in the chat room were asking him, I guess he had a thousand pictures he was going through. That's, isn't that the tough part of coming back from vacation? Well, number one is getting back. I always say you need a vacation from vacation because you get back and you're like, well, yeah, it's oh, okay. Now I need where's my little fiddle music? <laughs> I know, cry me a river. Oh man, but uh, you know, going through pictures, I I wanted to do the whole thing where I would curate my pictures every you know month, and I would pick out the best ones, and that's what I usually do on Google Photos. 
I will add, I'll go through like the whole month and I'll add them to like a little list of, um, you know, the best, I call it the best of album. And, um, it's, it's so, I get so behind. I think the last month I did it for was, I don't even know, but it was, it's great. It's a great feeling because then I have them hooked up to my Chromecast to my TV and they can go, <laughs> Beatmaster says, vacations can be exhausting, Rich. I know. Oh, I, I don't even want to go on vacation because they're so exhausting. Oh, I know. I know. <clears throat> These are the only problems we have in modern America, right? But, uh, but yeah, look at, oh man, I took some great pictures. I, you know what I like to do? I actually like to take similar pictures to like if someone nearby is taking a great picture and they show you your picture, like I'll just take like, this was, this was, um, uh, can you guys see this? This was last night's picture. This was, we, we, oh yeah, that's right. I need to send this. Josh, I need to send this to you. So I'm going to send that to him. Hang on. Um, we take the same picture because we are comparing cameras from the Note 9 and the Samsung or the Samsung Galaxy Note 9 and the iPhone, which I thought was pretty cool, right? And that that's a good looking picture. And then uh, this was a total copy. We did a little, um, we did a uh, portrait, a portrait um, mode standoff on the iPhone 10. S and also the Note 9. And they both they both came out pretty good. Pretty amazing. I my point is I love like I love copying pictures. Like this is the original picture I took and that looks like garbage, right? But then someone at the table took a picture like this and I said, "Oh my gosh, I would have never thought to put a little background and like make that look so fancy." So yeah, wouldn't it be cool if I poured poured it out right now? You're live. <laughs> Welcome back to the third hour of The Tech Guy. Rich DeMuro sitting in for Leo Laporte. We're taking your calls at 8888-ASK-LEO, 1-888-827-5536. And when I say we, I mean me. I'm answering your calls about technology. We're talking about all the little gadgets and things that you have in your life, whether you like them or not. Whether you are forced to have these things in your life or you have accepted them into your life, um, it doesn't matter because in today's day and age, you've got to deal with it. You've got stuff at work. You've got your phone. You've got apps. You've got your kids asking you. Well, they're probably telling you about this stuff, but I'm here to help. You have a question, you can give me a call. Phone number is 8888-ASK-LEO, 888-827-5536. Again, my name, Rich DeMuro, and... I am the tech reporter for KTLA Channel 5 in Los Angeles. You can learn more about me at richontech.tv. And that's where Bernadette sent in this question. Is there any benefit to pay full price versus monthly payments for the new iPhone? Thanks in advance for your response. Um, is there any benefit to paying full price versus monthly payments? Well, I mean, I think the benefit is just knowing that you're done with the payment. So... Um, it's not a secret that most people are buying their phones these days on a monthly payment plan. Because remember back in the day, you used to get your phone for free or it was a $200 payment and you know you would really pay more for your monthly service. Now they've just moved those numbers around. We pay a little bit less for our monthly service, but we pay our phone full price. And remember that change when everyone was all up in arms? What? What do you mean I got to pay $600? Most of the time, the only time you ever knew how much a phone actually cost back in the day was when you broke it and you'd go into the store and they'd say, well, it's going to be 600 bucks to get a new one. You say, what? 600? Well, I paid 200 for this thing. They said, well, that didn't include all the, you know, we, we took a, a large portion of that payment on our shoulders because you're paying for your service every month and you had a two-year contract, right? So uh, it's really a personal preference. Uh, personally, I like to be done with my payments, so I will save up the money and buy it. Monthly payments is how I think 99.9% .9 of people purchase these things. And most of the time, if not a majority of the time, they are not charging you any interest on these monthly payments. And if you do the math, generally it adds up to the same price. With the exception of Apple, if you do their program, which is in their stores, they add in Apple Care as well with the iPhone upgrade program. And so you are paying a little bit more to get that Apple Care included as well. And one other thing that you can't forget is if you don't have good credits, you may not qualify for those payment plans because most of the time it's not just a straight up divided by 24. They actually do run a credit check. So if you have a problem with uh, your credit, you may not qualify 
for that um, monthly payment. Keep in mind, you can also put a big down payment down on these devices and bring those monthly payments lower. You don't have to accept the terms that they have where they just divide it up by 24 months. You can, you can ask for, hey, I want to put 500 bucks down half the price of the phone and you can make your monthly price a little bit less. Richard is listening in Los Angeles. Richard, welcome to The Tech Guy. Hi, Rich. Nice to talk to you again. I have had a an Epson Workforce 845 printer fax machine for quite a while, which worked very well. But I just changed the router modem, modem and for some reason, the Workforce is not recognizing it. I can't get it to connect. Any thoughts? Uh, my thought is to do a full reset of the um, device because it's something that's happening where it's trying to connect to the old network. And anytime I change my network at home, I always have to reconnect my printer. And if you have an old network kind of lingering on this thing, um, on your old printer, it's probably going to interrupt the connection with the new network. So I would just go in, if you go on the Epson support website, there's usually some sort of way to factory reset the Epson 845 and get it to reconnect to your new network. So that's, that's my advice. I think that's probably going to be your best bet, Richard. Um, but these are, these are handy. If you can't do it that way, if you're, if you're still having trouble, um, a lot of things, uh, people don't realize that a lot of these printers come with apps that can let you print from them. So uh, you can try downloading the Epson app to your phone and printing that way. Sometimes that app will actually recognize the printer on your network. If it is connected, you might think it's not. Maybe it still is. But that would be another route to go is look on the um, App Store and um, just see kind of if they have an Epson app, which I'm sure they do. Um, just look for that and see if it finds your printer on the network. Good question, uh, Richard, in Los Angeles. And I like your name, by the way. That's, uh, that's one of my favorites. Micah is in Maine. Micah, you're on with Rich. Good afternoon. You're doing a great job enjoying your show. been listening for the past couple of weeks. Oh, thank you. Um, I, uh, I recently uh, cut the cord. Uh, Spectrum decided they were our last bill. They were stopped going stop to giving me the special, and uh, it went up by about $60 a month, and I said, that's it, forget about it, and uh, cut the cord, got rid of my landline from Spectrum, and got an UMA box, which is only $10 a month as opposed to $40 a month, and I went with DirecTV, um, and DirecTV Now, rather, um, and I'm getting that over the air. I have to keep the Spectrum Internet because that's the only thing available in my area, but I have a few quarry or qualms with DirecTV Now. Um, it, it's working fine. I had to get a new Roku box. I was, had the Roku 3, found the processor was a little slow, and picked up a Roku Ultra, which makes a big difference with mm -hmm. DirecTV now. How can and, I help? Uh, that's something. That, well, I like the channel surf, and the channel surfing isn't quite going quite as easily with DirecTV. And I'm wondering if there is a service that offers channel surfing similar to what I used to get with the old cable box. Oh, that's a tough one because you know that you can surf by swiping on your remote, right? Left left and right usually on the on the arrow keys, right? It brings me up and down, but yep. I can't really scroll through everything uh, like I used to, and I can't direct access anything, and you can't you don't have a back button. Yeah. Here's, here's the problem with all these streaming services is that, number one, they're buffering. So even with DirecTV now, which I have, and you can surf, but it's slow. It's not like the old channel surfing. But, I mean, if you had satellite, channel surfing was not the fastest thing in the world either. And, yes, you can't directly call out a number or type in a number on the remote like you could with a regular remote control. So here's the thing that's happening with all these. And I, I don't really have a good answer for you because it's just one of these things where it's not the way it's designed anymore. We're used to the old way of TV, punching in numbers, pressing up and down, just kind of looking at the guide, going in. Nothing is that fast when you're streaming. It's, it's a little bit of a more complex process. And the big problem is, is that, think about it, DirecTV now doesn't control anything anymore. They used to control, you know, the cable companies used to control what the remote looked like and what the box did. And that's no longer the case. Now, DirecTV Now has to make just an app and it has to work with Apple TV, it has to work with Chromecast, it has to work with Roku, it has to work with Fire TV, and all of those remotes are different and nothing is standardized. So, um, I feel your pain. And Micah, it's interesting because we're just going through this kind of period where we have to adjust 
because it's just not the same. And um, I think you did the right thing because that's that's kind of the setup I have. You might want to see if you have some friends that have an Apple TV or a Fire TV and see if the surfing is better on those. Perhaps it is, and that might work better for you. I know on my Apple TV, I just swipe left and right, and I can move through the channels. Definitely not as fast as channel surfing used to be. But um, with that said, it gives me that feeling of surfing the channels without actually changing them very fast. So I know back in the day, we always talked about, you know, fast channel changing. And when I had AT&T U-verse, it was really fast to change the channel. Not so much the case anymore with some of these streaming services. Rich DeMiro in for Leo Laporte on The Tech Guy. Phone lines open at 8888-ASK-LEO, 888-827-5536. When we come back, I'll tell you about the Microsoft update that might frustrate you and your computer. That's coming up next on The Tech Guy. Welcome back to The Tech Guy. Rich DeMiro sitting in for Leo Laporte today. You can learn more about me at my website, richontech.tv. The website here is techguylabs.com. Techguylabs.com, you can go on there and you can basically see all the stuff that we talk about on the show. It's organized very well and you can search by keyword, you can watch the segment, you can hear the answer. I mean, it's really great. So techguylabs.com, it's pretty great. Check it out. So if you are planning on updating your computer to Windows 10 October 2018 update, uh, they do basically two major updates a year. This one could be um, kind of interesting. So Microsoft has come out in a support document saying that the Windows 10 Windows update fails to check to see if your computer can actually handle the update. Let me say that again. The updater fails to check to see if your computer can handle the update. So if your computer does not have enough space to run the update and download it and do everything it needs to do housekeeping wise, your computer will just kind of restart, crash, whatever, while you're trying to do this update. So it will repeatedly fail and fail and fail again. And you will be frustrated because you will say, I'm doing everything right. What's going on? Well, someone forgot to put that line of code in that says, hey, let's make sure that they can uh, handle this on their hard drive before we try to do this installation. So uh, <laughs> their update, they do not say how much space you need on your computer, but Microsoft recommends, number one, to empty the trash on your computer. So the recycle bin, you can empty that out and that will uh, you know, free up some space on your computer. You can also move uh, less frequently accessed files to an external storage drive. So this is probably the easiest solution if you don't feel like doing all kinds of crazy stuff to your computer is if you want to make sure, well, first off, just look and see how much space you have on your computer. If you have, you know, like 15 gigs, I think you'll be probably okay or 20 gigs of free space, you'll probably be okay. But if you're really running low, like sometimes on laptops, you're running really low on, on disk space because they just don't come with large hard drives. Um, you know, move something off your drive, like a big file or two or three onto an external drive, do the installation, then come back to it. So um, kind of a, a weird little thing that Microsoft is, is acknowledging this. I guess, I mean, my question is how come they don't just update the whole update and make it so it does work? but maybe it's too far along for them to do that. Um, let's go to uh, Bill. Bill's listening in Chicago. Bill, what's on your mind? Hey, I got a couple questions. Uh, I don't know how much time I have, but... You can uh, take the rest of the hour, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sure nobody will mind. Right. Uh, question number one. Uh, I dropped my connections on my, from my cell phone. I have a Wi-Fi Linksys router, AC-1900, and it's okay upstairs, but sometimes when I'm in my garage, uh, a lot of times, which where I do stuff, um, I, my connection drops. And I look at my phone, and there's two different icons. There's one that looks like a radar, and there's one that's bars. And usually the bars are okay, or my radar is okay, but the bars... So I, what's the difference there, first off? Is this an Android device? Uh, Galaxy 9. A Galaxy, uh, Samsung Galaxy 9. And there's a there's a radar on it? Well, yeah, it comes with all phones. There's something that looks like a... 
Oh, you're talking the Wi-Fi signal. Your connectivity issues. Okay, so you're talking you're talking the signal bars versus the Wi-Fi bars. Okay, so which one are you losing up there now? In the in the Samsungs, here's what I think the solution is for you. I think you got to turn on a feature that basically helps you switch between Wi-Fi and cellular when it kind of feels like the Wi-Fi is spotty. Are you okay with using your cellular connection up there or no? Well, I want to use my Wi-Fi. You'd rather use Wi-Fi. All right. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you probably, if you want to use your Wi-Fi, it sounds like you need another another router because this router is not reaching up there. So you can try moving your router closer to this area. Can't you can't do that. So what a lot of people no, are doing. I mean, some kind of extender. What I bought was, is I bought one of those things that you plug into the wall. Yeah. But it's only for the same circuit, I found out. Yeah, and those aren't. Uh, oh, you did a you did a power line adapter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you have to be on the same circuit on your home uh, electrical wiring for that to work. So that that's one challenge of that. Uh, you could do a booster, but the problem is it's just boosting a bad signal, so it's not really going to work. I think for you, the best solution would be to get one of these new mesh networking systems. Have you heard of these things like Eero or Google Wi-Fi? or um, the Netgear Orbi, I think one of those is going to be your best bet because, um, you know, they, they will. that's what I did in my house, and I will never look back because you get a signal everywhere you need it. And in your case, if you need a signal in your garage, you just get one more of these little access points and you plug it in there. It doesn't need to be on the same, you know, electrical circuit as your home, and it will expand the network to your garage in a pretty nice way. And I think you'll be pretty happy with that. It's a base unit and an access unit? Well, it depends on the one you get, but, you know, some of them are, they're all slightly different with like the, with the one that I have, which is Eero, it's kind of the same. It's the, it's, they call them beacons and there's two different types and one of them just plugs in. One's more of like a network kind of, they don't really go by hub and spoke kind of thing. They just basically all work together. One of them obviously goes into your modem. Um, at the source, and then they kind of just radiate the signal out among each other, and they kind of work together to keep that signal strong. So, does it take the battery, the second unit that I would put downstairs, and it, how does it connect to the one that's at the uh, router? Is it uh, powered? I mean, well, yes. the one that I plugged in downstairs yeah. is powered. Yeah, it is powered. So you have to plug it in. You start, and the app kind of walks you through it. So you plug the first one in. Uh, where your internet comes into the home and then it says, okay, it goes through a little setup process. Then it says, okay, well now let's set up the next one. And you take your next one. It will kind of, some of them I've seen give you a little picture of your house. It says, where do you want to put this? Or it'll give you an idea of where the next best place to put it is. Um, and then you put that one in and then they kind of all piggyback off of each other. How much are they? Uh, Eero is the most expensive. I would say an average system Probably two hundred to four hundred dollars, depending on how many nodes you get. I think if you want to, if you want to start with the cheapest one, uh, you probably want to use the Google Wi-Fi. That's pretty inexpensive. I've seen them at Costco. I think uh, like a two pack. I don't know, maybe one hundred eighty bucks or something like that. So and it still works. And it still what? Works. Oh yeah, it wor it works fantastic. Uh, I I will I will tell you, Bill. I have recommended these things to so many different people, and I get emails all the time telling me how great it is. And for me personally, uh, I pay for a hundred down at my house, and before I was getting about fifty down all throughout the house with the standard Wi-Fi, and now I get one twenty in every corner of my house. Um, without one spot that does not have Wi-Fi. They really are a great new technology. And as people discover them, they realize that you're finally getting that Wi-Fi signal that you are paying for every single month. And by the way, that bill seems to go up every every year or so too. So great question, Bill. I think that that's going to solve your problem and uh, you know get your uh, garage into the Wi-Fi network. Rich DeMiro in for Leo Laporte. We're taking more of your calls at 8888-ASK-LEO, 1-888-827-5536. Give me a call if you have a question about your tech. Bill, are you still there? Yes, hey. I am. All right. Does that answer your question? Did you uh, yeah, you think you think you're going to check one of those out? Yep. Yeah, I would. Um, I I mean, Eero. Here's the thing. So my my problem with Google is it's great, no, no, no. but the problem with I Google. Mean, go well. My other question has to do with receivers and TVs and wireless and consoles. 
Uh, what you mean consoles? Like what? Like a a gaming console? PS4. Okay. Yeah. So what? What do you need to know? I want, and I'm looking at the Arctic Seven, but I want to be able to use my a wireless for my PC and my um, either Xbox or something, and I could plug it into the Xbox. You know what I mean? I need a like an adapter, right? Mm-hmm. I can plug it into my Xbox. I can plug the adapter into my TV, or I can plug it into my AV receiver. Now, I don't know which one I should use the best. You got an adapter. Most- you can plug it into your AV receiver. You can plug it into your Xbox, or you can plug it into which was the other one? The TV. Well, PS4 or TV. Uh-huh. And what's the adapter for? To sync up a wireless headset. Oh. Um, well, which one do you want to, which, it, it's just a USB. It's just like to, to, to what, to power the headset or to send a signal or what? To send a signal. And it just needs any old USB? Yes. Okay. Well, I would do the one that stays on the most. So for me, you know, your TV, like I have a Chromecast and, you know, the problem is when the TV goes off, the Chromecast doesn't, is off. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. you you probably want this thing to be on whenever you're using it. So if you're using it with coordination of the PS, you know, four, you know, maybe plug it into the back of that because you know every time you turn that on, you're going to be using it. So whatever one you use, if you're going to be using it with a combination of things, then I would get a separate plug um, that you plug into your wall that's always powered and plug it into that. That's my recommendation. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I appreciate it. I called last week. Couldn't reach you. But I appreciate you answering my questions. All right, Bill. I appreciate it uh, in Chicago there. Watch me on uh, WGN Channel 9. Okay. All right. In the mornings. Thanks, Bill. Have a great day. Bye. Welcome back to The Tech Guy. Rich Demuro sitting in for Leo Laporte. Rich on tech.tv is my website. Techguylabs.com is the site for the show. I uh, just got an email to my website uh, from, or actually my Facebook page, facebook.com slash rich on tech. Steve Ruiz said, um, can you recommend an iPhone app that allows me to obscure, digitize, or blur out photos? From time to time, I crop out certain photos and send them to friends and family. I'd like to have the capability to blur out the photo. I'm open to any suggestions or recommendations. Thank you for your time and patience. Well, Tell my wife that I have patience, please. <laughs> Sometimes I don't. Uh, the app that I use, now I notice a lot of people when they, you can do this on the iPhone itself if you um, just press the edit button on there and that will bring up the markup tool that's built into the iPhone and you can scribble things out and do stuff that way. But here's the thing. I, <clears throat> I've i heard that that's not the best solution because people, I've noticed that people use the marker and it is almost like highlights it. Even though it's in black, you can still see what's written underneath. So that might not be your best solution. Um, the one that I use on my Mac computer is called Redacted. And this is super simple. It only has three options. It has blur, it has um, pixelation, and then it has a blackout line. And I just looked it up and it actually is available for the iPhone as well. So um, it's $1.99. So I know it's not going to break the bank, but if you're, you know, trying to... Now, here's the thing, Steve. What are you sending to your friends and family that you have to redact? <laughs> I mean, if I'm sending a picture to my family, it is funny because there are times when you're like, I, if this picture got out, maybe it's not that good. I mean, I'm not saying anything that's, um, you know, I'm just saying there's, there is some personal information in photos that you send to friends and family versus photos that you post to social media. So maybe, I don't know, that's something that you could be posting there. Um, but the website is, um, you can actually just go to, um, it's on iOS in the app store. Look up, um, let's see, it's just called Redacted and it says censor stuff. And their website is useredacted.com, useredacted.com. I downloaded it for the Mac app store. I don't even know if I paid for it or not. I can't remember. Oh yeah, six ninety nine. Wow. I can't believe I paid that much for that. Maybe they've raised the price, but it's well worth it. I use it all the time. And, you know, I use it for web pages when I'm I'm doing screenshots and explanations of things. It really does help. So you can do that. There's a million different ways of doing this. I'm just recommending what's worked for me, but I think that that one will work for you. So check it out. We have Diane in uh, Rancho Bernardo. Diane is in Rancho Bernardo. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking for a new tablet to take place of one that died about six months ago. 
And I've been using my laptop as kind of a tablet and my cell phone as kind of a tablet. And so I really want a new one that probably would be a 10-inch or 9-inch. And I'm trying to decide the best one. I've always had Samsung in the past. And they, there seems to be a lot of choices, and I don't know quite which one to go with. Diane, I'm going to tell you the answer that I tell everyone when they ask me about a tablet, and I know it's not going to be a Samsung because here's the thing. When it comes to tablets, I get it. The Samsung tablets are going to do what you need, and you're going to be perfectly happy with kind of the basic functionality. But to me, the best value out there with a tablet is really the iPad. And... I'm not sure if you're open to switching to the iPad. I'm not trying to push Apple on you, but this is why I recommend the iPad over other tablets. When you are looking at the quality of apps that are available for the iPad versus Samsung versus Android, when it comes to tablets, the quality is on the iPad and the apps are on the iPad because here's the thing. The user base for the iPad is much larger than what you would see with the Samsung tablet. Is there a specific thing you're doing on this tablet that you need well, specific apps I, for? I, the one thing that I haven't been able to do in the past is spreadsheets. and I, So I'm working on some way to do spreadsheets. So I would, because my computer, is, my laptop is about to die too. And I, <clears throat> I, the only thing that I do on that that I can't do on a tablet is uh, spreadsheets. Oh, well, in that case, I mean, have you looked at the, the Microsoft Surface? No. Okay. Well, that's a. I they, have a price problem too. Well, what's the price problem? I'm looking at under four hundred dollars. Okay. Well, the Surface can do that. Um, I think you'd be fine with the Surface, or they just came out with a new Surface. It's called the Surface Go. And what's cool about the Surface is that, and realistically, I'll be honest, you can actually run Office on a lot of different devices. Um, not the Samsung, as far as I know. If you wanted to go, are you running Office like you need Excel? Well, I need Excel, but I don't want to pay $5 a month for it or okay. whatever well, it is. In that case, I would just use Google Sheets, which is a free alternative. That's what I've been trying to learn. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, it's a little bit different. I use it every every day, basically, and I'm not a spreadsheet open guy. Office. Is, is Open Office any good? Uh, I, I think Google is way better, personally. Okay. I used to use the Open Office, and I just find that Google is simpler. It's updated. Okay. It's all in the cloud. Um, you can even access it offline because they save a lot of the stuff to your local device. Um, okay. So my, my recommendation for $330, you can get the iPad. You install Google Sheets on there and boom, you've got a great solution. Now, later on down the line, you can add a keyboard to that. You can add a pencil if you want. So a stylus for another 100 bucks. But you don't have to do this all at once. But if you want Excel... Or if you want that spreadsheet and the ability to edit in a pretty decent way, you're probably going to want to add a couple of those accessories. Um, uh -huh. The other well, thing, I, the other thing I, I like is is the Microsoft Surface. So I think the uh, the Surface Go is going to be a good solution, and that starts at uh, it might be a little bit more expensive um, than what you want to pay. Uh -huh. um, it's probably closer to like five hundred dollars. So, but I would I would take a look at that because that will do a lot of the stuff you need. Now, the iPad, is, would that be a 10-inch? It's not going to be a 10-inch iPad. So the 10-inch is uh, the Pro. That's going to be a more expensive model. Um, yeah. The standard iPad, uh, I think it's about the 8-inch eight, eight screen. Yeah, see, we, we read the newspaper on our tablets. I've been using my laptop for that, too. We d read the newspaper every morning. I'm looking at this. Um, Okay, uh, let's see. What is it? Let's see. Uh, you, you know, let's see. What is this? Uh, 9.7? 9.4 inches. Okay, the, the, the screen size on the standard iPad, uh, it's 9.4 inches by 6.6 .6 inches. So you're good. And I, I, I read on my iPad. I read magazines. like a, almost, It almost shows like the full page of the magazine, like the way it was intended. It's a little bit smaller. Um, you could easily read the, your newspaper on here. You, you'll be very happy with the size of the standard iPad, for sure. How difficult would it be to switch from uh, Samsung or, or um, that, 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 pro, that program to iPad. I've always been anti-Apple, but... Oh, you're anti-Apple. For no good reason. Okay. But. Yeah, there's no... I mean, I, I understand. I mean, um, 
you know, I, I know you're going to get the iPad, and the next thing you know, I'm going to see you with an iPhone next year. I'm going to see you yeah, with uh, an Apple Watch, AirPods, well, Mac my computer. My home is, is, is Apple, so I should really grow up. and. Well, Diane, they'll love you because you can finally FaceTime them. True, true. That's good. That's good. I like that, and that's what I would do. So how hard is it going to be to switch over? I don't think very hard. I mean, what do you have on this other tablet? Well, it was all Android, of course. Yeah. But, but I mean, you uh, could... my, my, of course, my uh, laptop is Windows, which I try to avoid. I have Google Chrome on it. I think you just go, I think you just go through um, um, all your apps on your Samsung. You just look them up on the App Store and you download oh. the similar app for your iPad. And I think in many cases, Diane, you're going to find that the functionality of the apps on the iPad are far superior to what you found on your Samsung device. So, good question, and um, I think you're going to be pretty happy with the standard iPad for 330 bucks. All right, there you have it. Uh, good question from Diane in uh, Rancho Bernardo. We've got more of your questions after this. We're going to close out the show. 8888-ASK-LEO, 1-888-827-5536. Rich DeMiro sitting here taking your tech calls. More of them after this. You're listening to The Tech Guy, Rich DeMiro, sitting in for Leo Laporte today, closing out the show. We've got time for one more call at 8888-ASK-LEO, 1-888-827-5536. You got a question about your technology, give me a call. I'll try to do my best to get you on before the end of the show. Now, we've talked a lot about the Apple Watch and health and how it can do an ECG John Hancock is an insurance company, one of the largest and oldest in North America. They're going to stop doing traditional life insurance policies and instead only sell what are called interactive policies. So what does that mean? Well, they track your fitness and health data through wearable devices and smartphones. The company said earlier this week, it's a 156-year-old insurance company. They uh, first did this in 2015. And they said, you know what? This has been such a success. We're going to do this across all of our life insurance coverage. And apparently this is really popular in other parts of the world, South Africa and Britain. You basically get big discounts for hitting exercise targets that are tracked on wearable devices. So it doesn't have to be an Apple Watch. It could be a Fitbit or any other device that connects and talks to their service. So you do your normal day. You do your exercise. Your little device on your wrist writes back to them or reports back to them, and boom, you can get gift cards. It depends what you sign up for. You can get gift cards for retail stores. Um, if you log the healthy food that you're eating, that could earn you some points. So why do they want to do this? Well, the longer you live, the more they collect on their policies and the less they have to pay out. So that's why they want you to live longer so that they make more money off of you. And also... Uh, eventually, theoretically, it would cost them less to provide this insurance because they're providing insurance to a quote-unquote healthier group of people. Now, some might argue they're excluding a lot of people in this process, people that might have health, a health condition, people that might not be as healthy as the next person. And in that case, wait, that's not, that's not fair. Why, why should I not get the best rates because I refuse to wear this thing that kind of tells all about my health when the next guy will and they're going to get the best rate. So they say you can sign up. You don't have to wear it. You don't, you don't have to report all your health data. But if you don't, well, you're probably going to pay, um, looks like about an average of 15% more on your premiums because people who are wearing these things can get up to 15% off their premiums, among other benefits. The program is called Vitality, and uh, data that they've collected so far, this according to an article in Reuters, says that Vitality policyholders worldwide live 13 to 21 years longer than the rest of the insured population. So that's clearly why. That's 13 more years they can collect on you, which... Sounds like a long time to me. So I don't know. I'm kind of divided on this. I love the idea of having the wearable and I love the idea of me personally collecting that data. And I'm even for the aggregation of anonymous data because it can tell a lot about our population, right? The trends we're seeing, um, you can really identify a lot. But when you talk about getting into the world of you reporting directly to your health company 
or your life insurance company or your employer, that's where it gets a little crazy because um, there are definitely some privacy concerns with that setup that I would be concerned about, even though I am healthy, but you just never know. Do you really want someone knowing that much about you? Joe in Knoxville, welcome to the show. Hello. Hello. What's your question? question? Well, I've got my cable, telephone, internet services all through Comcast, and I've had a lot of issues in the past with them, and there's quick fixes, throw another box on the on the system and say there's something wrong with the older one and stuff. And just recently they changed my box and I do a lot of stuff with networking where I need to open uh, certain ports to devices. And before I could just go in, log into the router, go to my uh, port forwarding, put in the IP address that I want and the port that I want to forward and do it. Well, now their new box, you have to go in through, instead of logging straight into the router, then you have to go to another screen log back in through your account and then you can do port forwarding but instead of listing letting you put in an ip address and the port it comes up with a list of all these devices by names not by ip address so it may say uh some of the stuff it just says like you know desktop pc some it says xbox some it says you know light on and then some numbers and stuff so but the number of devices I see showing up, it, you know, it's hard to figure out which one's on what IP address. And I'm looking for a solution for a new router I could put on the side, just do put their box in bridge mode and do my own routing and Wi-Fi. So you need a suggestion on the router? Yeah, I'm looking at the possibility of, of going to a Netgear, uh, what they call I think they call it Nighthawk. Mm-hmm. That's a popular series. one. It's got those big antennas and, on it. And I need something, you know, that I can go into and, you know, actually say I want such and such IP to have such and such port open. Right now, I've had to throw a, a device into the DMZ to get, just open up all the ports to it. And I don't want to have to do that because there's certain devices I just want a, a certain port open. Now, are you are you device. are you certain you can do this with Comcast? Will they allow this? They say, yeah, I can put I can put their box into bridge mode, okay. which will basically just make it one out IP output and then let the my router do the the DHCP in house. Yeah, that's probably what you want to do. Um, I, the Nighthawk is a very popular device. Um, like the AC nineteen hundred is is the one that I'm looking at right now online. And um, what's your hesitation about getting this one? Do you think it won't do what you need it to do? Well, I'm, I'm not familiar with some of the newer sh- stuff available on routers. You know, I do need something. I've got devices that are on 2.4 and 5 gig, and I'm also, you know, looking for the speed uh, through the device. Well, this looks like so, it does uh, the dual band, so I think you're going to be good there. And I think if any router is going to handle what you need, um, it's going to be this one. This is a very popular router. It's got, um, you know, it's... It, some of the third party, the smaller routers may not handle all of the things that you need to do, but I think this one will because uh, it's a full featured router. It's $179, so it is kind of expensive. Um, do you need that much router? Yeah, because uh, the type of work that I do, I need to have ports open for different things. And because I do, I do a lot of testing on some hardware and just wanting to be able to put it on a, a port that's not you know, normally out there on the web that I can get to to test things remotely and stuff. And uh, the box that my, that my internet comes through also handles my telephone. And I was debating on whether to go t- to one of the upper uh, Netgear boxes that they've got that also handles the telephone too. Uh, or- I don't know. I'd probably leave that out because then if, if something goes wrong, you, you've got too many things uh, in one. This, uh, this Nighthawk has 21,558 reviews on Amazon. So, uh, Joe, something tells me that you're not the first person out of those 22,000 people to need some of these uh, more complex solutions from this router. So I, I say go with the Netgear and I think you'll be pretty happy. Uh, let me know how that goes. Well, if you can believe it, we have come to the end of the show. If you want to see anything that I've talked about here in the show, it's all well done and uh, sliced and diced at the website, 
techguylabs.com. Thanks so much for listening to The Tech Guy. It has been my pleasure filling in for Leo this weekend. Leo will be back next weekend. Until then, please keep in touch. You can find me at richontech.tv. My podcast is called Rich on Tech, so you can listen to me there. Thanks to uh, everyone here for helping me out do the show. Mike, Kim, John, Leo, and Lisa, and everyone at Twit. I am Rich DeMiro. I will talk to you real soon. Have a great day. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.